Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and um, you know, an example I'm thinking of is a, uh, a unfortunate circumstance, but a layoff resolution. Uh, okay. Same thing in the language. The board determines that staff will be reduced for the following year. It always comes in the form of an action or a resolution and a staff recommendation um, regarding, in this case, the uh, the value. So, so I, don't think is it I don't think determine uh, is. After determine, then, is it the instead of the is it that, determines that, the estimates we as worth that? I don't know. I just no, read it. I just read it. You know, there's something we have to do. But if it's that's how the law is stated, yeah. that's fine. I just, I just read it and thought, as a new board member, without understanding, like I would think, oh, I have to do this. I like reading the clerk. I just wanted to clarify that you weren't thinking we're going to go figure it out. We're not giving you a key to the warehouse to go. Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's okay. It is yeah. not. You don't well, Peggy wants, wants that. Yeah. yeah. I like cleaning my garage. So. Yeah. Peggy wants it. We're supposed to. And that's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're just ready to get in there. You can head down there today. <laughs> Those are tasks that uh, that was that was like mm -hmm. that. Just looks a lot better than it used to. Okay. Can we? You've experienced them when we've had them on agenda items before. Right? Yeah, I, yeah, but I just wanted to make sure because it says we shall determine. But can we just verify that as a law? Like that's how the law states it, or whatever. So that all of us are on the same page. No matter who's sitting at the table. Okay, so can film us the first reading, but you'd like at least. Legal references, you'd like to know which one states that? Yeah, or just make sure that's actually how it's stated. Like, it's not slight, right? Like, if that's exactly how the statute states it, I don't want to change it. <coughs> that's the worst thing to do. I just want to make sure that. Because yeah, I know you guys bring them. That's okay. He's not asking us to do it. And I have a couple questions just as far or at not as the wording that. Um, so staff makes recommendations for the donation. Yes. Staff looks and sees where it might be good for to surplus items. Yes. And and how do you? Um, okay, so a teacher say a teacher leaves and takes all her personal things out of her classroom, and what is left? Um, how do you determine what is excess? So depending on what it is exactly, so if it's furniture, there's end of useful life for that versus computers, there's end of useful life. Uh, IT has a refresh schedule. Uh -huh. Usually it's about three years on the computer equipment. Okay. So we'll surplus a lot of the Chromebooks. Um, if there's a <coughs> PC or individual teacher desk, um, usually you get about 20 years out of furniture. Uh -huh. um, so there's standard use of life. And then beyond that, if it's a textbook, nothing would be surplus unless it was replaced with new curriculum, so that would come from the instructions office. What about other items? Like I'm, I'm just thinking, um, for instance, maybe the year before I retired, I got a, a school power grant for binoculars for the class set, and the teacher, if I left them there because it went along with our curriculum, the teacher who took the spot didn't know anything about them, just threw them in the trash. And mm -hmm. lots of, lots and lots of books that are perma bound class sets that if a teacher doesn't want, they just throw in a class. So I get calls from um, the maintenance workers, parents, why are you throwing away all this stuff? Why are you? Mm -hmm. um, so, how, how is that? How is there a better way to handle that? Because I know other places, even if the teacher here doesn't want them, would. Can I just say this from the system systems in place after what's been 11 years? I would assume there's different. Well, well, if I can respond to that, we had several teachers send some stuff down to the warehouse, manipulatives, other things when they retired, a bunch of other stuff. And oh. then I put a call out, an all call via email to the principals and said, We have this stuff in the warehouse. Uh -huh. Does anybody want any of it? And they had some staff come down and look at it. A lot of them took things. Some of it was no longer useful because it's not the way we we're teaching anymore. Uh -huh. So um, that we. Um, Actually donated to another um, a, a Boys and Girls Club wanted some of it, so we oh, were able right. to give them some of the stuff. But we don't trash anything um, that I'm aware of anymore. We, they know they're supposed to send it down. We put an all call out and go through it. Okay, so there's new there's we new regulations in line. If you 
We have a process. Have Hopefully, they're following the process. Okay. Oh, well, we That's can't, right. We I just felt. Have, until we have a policy, we can't have an administrative regulation. That, so there's an administrative regulation that corresponds with this policy. So once that policy is adopted, then we will adopt an administrative regulation to push out to. We don't have an AR unless we have a PP mm -hmm. attached to it. Well, I know one of the things that we did as a group is we partnered with a church that bought a big container to take to Africa to use for children built as a building and put lots and lots of learning material in it. But we kind of did that on our own. Board of Policy to continue to update business of gifts, grants, and requests. Okay, okay. Uh, this policy essentially lays out parameters for which we can accept gifts and donations, specifically calling out that we do not think the donation uh, has the strings attached, such as uh, ongoing costs associated with the program or curriculum. Um, beyond that, um, it's at the board's discretion on staff's recommendation on what gifts to accept and it's been we have already have our same item with gifts and donations so we just um, spell spells out some of the parameters associated with it. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So this um, I know before, for instance, uh, school power donated a whole big set of you know Keyboards. Keyboards. Things, keyboards, and a, a person was hired to help teach that after school. Mm -hmm. But we knew it wasn't, I mean, it was just kind of an experiment to see how this will go. And does that go along with something that could be of value for a few years? But then, I mean, would we not do something like that because we couldn't necessarily sustain it or we wouldn't want to try it? Uh, it would depend on the situation, but. Yeah, I think that's clear with the school board trust school power trustees. I mean, they're well aware of like they're just providing something to be tried. There's it doesn't mean there's any longevity to it. That's clear, and that we can never obligate staff like, and that might have happened over you know every decade over Hickok's jam. We know better than I would, but you know someone always goes, "We want," and then they go, "Oh, we can't do that." Right? So you, that's always been clear for the nineteen years, eighteen years, whatever I've been involved. With. But the staff, a staff member was trained to do it. Yeah, but after school. No, did it during the school class. So they took training? Uh huh. And they did it for their class. They did it. Somebody actually did it for my class. Yeah. You know, thinking that the um, music would help with math and other things. Yeah, no, I remember the whole, I remember the whole thing that was up at UCI's. Program, program. Um, but I don't think unless it came to the board and the board said yes, we can sustain that, then it was just a trial, right? Mm -hmm. trial, sure like you could fund a trial. We, we, yeah, we can't. There has to be the funding on the other side. That's part of what we talk about with school power. I didn't realize this is that percent mm -hmm. district's actually covered by. Someone could have approved that. I mean, I don't. That's know. what I mean. Yeah, it could have been this year that was or what school power. No, that was like. Two Um, and that, that, you know, a lot of the um, methods for dealing with that have changed as a result of some of those years, where there okay, were that were that were given and then there were additional costs. So there was then the, um, why aren't you sustaining this or why aren't you doing it again? So then the whole method changed. That's why funding is so specific and so mm -hmm. it takes so long to put it together because it's, they want it to last and we have to know if it's something that we want to undertake after the first year. And even so I believe grants, all that has been changed. Yeah, and, and because of um, the binoculars and the keyboard, teacher both grants, teacher grants, work teacher grants now work with, with instead right. of outside of the school, which is exactly. what it used to. And so because of that, donors donors start being upset. Then it was like, oh, well, then we should figure out the work. I care. You have some questions? I do. I have. Um, can you? Because I read through and I saw different places in here, and but I did not read. Um, the advertising policy or advertising policy, which you're referring to, 
But can you talk about like banners that hang at the school for local bars? I'm going to add that description. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We have banners that hang in the gym uh, for local for bars. Sponsorship. So yeah, that... for sponsorship. And so I'm trying I'm reading this. I kept going, mm. The big one we had one year was over the Santa Fiber because you know, it's Jenny, the same. worked for the district, plus their kids were in school here. And so they uh, they just could not have any reference to it being a bar on mm -hmm. the banner. So it just had Sandpiper and a little Sandpiper bird. And it was a very touchy issue because yeah, that, is, that is their family Sandpiper. business for years. And it's, but we couldn't have anything on the banner that indicated it was, in, you know, come down for happy hour. I mean, it's. Right. I read this and I was just like, does that mean they can't advertise at all? Because I have seen their advertisement where it does discuss alcohol or does give slang to drinking mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and their comment was, well, we're advertising to parents, not students. Mm -hmm. That sounds stupid. It's still so a school, it's still school site. No. Right? And so mm -hmm. I, this seems like this would say, no, you can't do that. Like, this is clear. Mm -hmm. I just didn't read the advertisement one. It's very, it's very clear as well. It even specifies the size of the banners okay. for indoor and outdoor and the time frame. And then the principal has to approve all. all. Okay, and then if the principal approves, the principal would be sweet. So it I'm should be appropriate. Sight the, stuff. The principal should, yeah. Okay. Well, I thought this was really clear. Right now, it seems like we have really heavy real estate ads. Mm -hmm. I think um, that the really yeah. have figured out this is a great way to get advertising for my business. Yeah. <laughs> for the Jogathon, it's like. <laughs> and then um, um, for books and materials, like the I Am Jazz, the, the local illustrator one who's going to the libraries and stuff. Mm -hmm. That follows this process. So there's a process that and the AR in place that they would then. This is a new policy, so. That's what you're doing. Yeah, so the, or whatever it might be. I mean, we have lots of local artists and um, but illustrators and books and writers. Mm -hmm. So if they wanted to donate, now there would be an AR for them to follow. Yeah, right. First of Okay, sweet. Um, and then on the last paragraph, so the superintendent is and shall annually provide a report of these gifts. I know we get the one with the artwork. Right, so will we kind of get something like that on an annual basis or whatever those are? Someone donates an endowment towards where's every donation. Page nine. We bring every donation to you. Page nine. Page nine. It all comes to you if your approval, so we can pull this we can summarize that at the end of the year if you wish. Well, because it says it well, it says over a summary at the end of the year. Oh, it doesn't right. say when. We don't leave. Yeah, we do it. We as we get that. Oh, we just do it as we get it, so it's but it's always in our agenda. Yes, yeah, so right. you accept all the conditions. Okay, no, just yeah. show annually. That's what it's like. I was like, um, oh, is there then an inventory annually? That's what I'm trying to figure out. I just think as each one comes along, yeah, that's I get it. So, so, does that even include like a like Carol saying if somebody donates a book? Yeah, everything we need to accept. So, so, um, so do we want to say that it shall be annually? It says it's annually. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think so. That's just for four. That's just for like a. Like we just haven't put it all together in one kind of. So here's what we received last year, and that's in, that's what this policy will dictate once it's adopted. Then, so we're not. That's not currently what we're doing, but once the policy is adopted, so we'll get to it. Okay. We will. We will do that. Because we asked about the art, I was just confused of whether. Yeah, the art was, you know, that's because just simply an insurance. Because um, uh, of joint. A reminder of, kind of costs and, and, and so forth. But yeah, we bring all of the, those that donate to the treasury funds, obviously, as um, most people donate. But uh, we bring that to you for board approval. Uh, every regular meeting that we have those. Um, yeah, they're in there all the time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we'll just have they're to use is at some point. Provide an annual. Here's all the gifts that we receive. So we'll take all of those and just put it together for okay. fiscal year. For, for fiscal fiscal year. year. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, just two more questions. But, um, um, one is um, when we get on all of our old stuff, like the art that costs money and stuff that maybe wasn't built into that. Is there something in this policy that is addressing that? Because I didn't say anything about anything old. This is all about new going forward. I mean, you want to inventory that? No, we just inventory it, but I kind of meant like, if, if there's stuff you found, I don't know, is, it, is there anything besides the art that's really an old no. gift? No. Okay. okay, so never mind. And then um, on the appreciation, uh -huh. uh, for the last one, it's a, it's a pretty broad thing the board can do for appreciation, we change that. which I had no idea. We can. It's not, it's not required by the codes. And that's what I'm going to say. So, is this in the new law or code no. that says we can appreciate in any of these ways? Is this what CSBA recommended for appreciation? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, would, I would stop at um, letters of recognition or board resolutions and just take all the rest out. Yeah, because like Manic can get. Yeah. That yeah, all begins. What were you doing, Tiana? I love appreciation on page P11. I'm on the page, yeah. Okay. So, or board resolution, letter of recognition or board resolution, and take okay. out plaques and all yeah, the members. Yeah, there is the decision oh, made to do that, but when you But we don't need to lay it out like that? Because that's within our right, but I, I, got it. Or you just quite often get people up to ask me how much money do I have to give for them to name a building. We're not doing that. And I said, <laughs> I asked a board member, and I said, we do that. Right? And it stopped the conversation. Well, they, they basically, oh, well. they have to be deceased. So, <laughs> by, our, by our policy on that. Yeah, best that's practice is well, that's, 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 that's a big gift, gift. yeah. If you really just deceased. the highlighted part, though, mm -hmm. it, the suggestion is, you have limited yourself to letters of recognition and board resolutions. So just delete the. So you might delete the whole sentence if you. Uh, I agree with that. So how about this show of appreciation? Show appreciation. That's good. Then we can do it. Deemed appropriate. Yeah. And then we can discuss as a board. I'm just thinking at the time looking at this with trees, gardens, and. Oh, I saw. I didn't see that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
funding cannot come into the district accounts because uh, we cannot then in turn donate it. So we have created a system that the funds will not end up on our books, but we have a, a better system for that so that the teachers, they accept money and then process it accordingly with our policy and the law. Uh, we don't want teachers taking cash, putting it in their accounts, yeah. writing checks. Right. Right. Uh, just... That's highly, it's completely illegal okay. uh, for teachers to do that. Um, and saying that we don't have a policy around that, we do a very specific policy around that um, that we've shared out. So I think for the for that, that's a different conversation because this is specific to money coming in as a donation okay. to the district, which then passes into the district's accounts in some way, shape, or form. It may go into the athletics accounts. Um, it may go into you know a different kind of funding, or maybe on uh, on behalf of so for like the jogathon, for example. Those sponsorships are going to PTA. We simply are hosting for a very limited window of time the banners for that. So it's leading up to the event, and they are removed shortly after the events. Um, it's is kind of what we've been doing now, which has been good. No, 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 right. Right. Which was kind of the case until we got that policy kind of dialed in. So. Specific to your question, do you, um, our teachers haven't necessarily been fundraising. For Projects he use school power mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them don't even yes. spend their school power designations. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, it moves over to the principal's discretionary so that they can help facilitate the use of that funding. Mm -hmm. okay. So that there's the yeah. equitable component okay. that you're referring to. And then does this affect the BP 1325? I don't need to know it now, I just kind of like, if we're waiting for this, if there's anything that this policy changes because it references. That policy within it on page ten. Uh, like our policy? Yeah. No, it does. No. Our it policy is, is really it's more recent. It was adopted in twenty seventeen. Right. Um, it doesn't change. Because All it does is refer to that as well as to our AR um, because there's that freedom of speech. We have a limited public forum, and okay. then it clearly lines up what kinds of sponsorships are allowed as long as they are within the vision mission of the school. Um, However, we clearly do not allow um, sponsorships that promote the sale of, of materials that are legal or inconsistent with school objectives, right. materials that are attached for tobacco, intoxicants, non nutritious foods, beverages, movies, or products consumable for children. So that is our, that's the board adopted policy that says if there's something congruent. And I might just look it up before I think, but I thought yeah. I'm and there's an AR attached to that that we share with staff. So. Okay, so then they are all this. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> are individual students allowed to fundraise for something they're interested in? No. And this isn't. This I is, know this isn't about this, but just uh, another question. Mm -hmm. uh, no. They can't just go on a campus and fundraise. They have there's uh, laws around that. So with this, soliciting funds on campus. Because I know a lot of kids will say, hey, I'll sponsor you for five cents a lap if you'll sponsor me for five cents a lap. Well, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, at, at I an mean, elementary school level, job, I'm not sure job, to, yeah. to yeah, what yeah. degree, but at the secondary yeah. level, you could just walk on the campus and start soliciting funds for kids. Okay. Right. okay. Now, if the kids were going on a trip, like a band or, yeah. or right, where the whole group is going, and some of the, they it's needed to fundraise, District sponsor. If they did it online, <laughs> they would just follow this policy. Is that kind of what that means? They're supposed to. They, the entity that's sending them, so us, the, the person who's in charge, the coach, along with their boost organization, need to follow the program. Follow that. Mm -hmm. Once this is in place, which just helps you put all in place. Okay, I'm, I'm there with you because I thought school powers understood this, but there are little sections where it's for us. Yeah. It's if you don't have anything mm -hmm. behind you, you need to enforce. Okay, awesome. Ready for the next one? And which one is next? Let's do 4154 because it's in your right. packet. Help her, right? It's in. Yes. So this uh, replaces um, a couple of existing board policies, 4208 and 4405. Um, so it aligns the, the numbering systems. Uh, this um, board policy pertains to all employees, mm -hmm. classified, certificated, and management. And it just outlines our. Um, requirements to provide health and welfare benefits. As specified in the collective bargaining agreement, it does state that then certificated in uh, management, um, administrative and supervisory employees, uh, not in the bargaining units, receive the same benefits as the other groups. Yeah. Okay. 
Yes, they were. <laughs> Tell yeah. me the type. <laughs> yes. Oh, so that's not who's in the bargaining unit. That's why I was like, who's not in the bargaining unit? But now I get it. Okay, so you're calling out each other's groups and then the unrepresented. Okay. Okay. Um, and then in the one, two, three, four, the um, fourth paragraph that says pays at least 60% of medical expenses covered under terms of plan. Is that like as well as that in the contract? That's in the Affordable Care Act. Okay. Um, and then um, when I read with re the next paragraph with respect to eligibility for state for the minimum, district shall not discriminate in favor of employees uh, who are among the highest paid by far. I don't know if that's a law or not a law, but thank you very much. I believe it is a law. Because it's, it's a is it is it a great way to have equitability right over the city of So it's I didn't realize I'm not going to thought it Thank you. Um, and then um, the continuous <coughs> coverage, I'm confused by what all that meant because it's kind of like retired certificate employees and others, which does that mean everyone? So this is COBRA, essentially. So oh, if somebody no. loses coverage, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And then thank you so much for all of the legal references, including cases and everything else. The only legal references I did not see in this new policy that were in the other policies. And it could be because of the change in marriage versus just domestic partners. And so it might not need to be covered, but if it does before the first rate, if it can go back, there's family code 298, 298.5, 299, 299.5, and 299.6 are not actually covered in here, but were covered in the other one. And I read the 300, which wasn't around when this was first written. So I'm not sure if 300 trumps that, or we don't talk about those because that's what the Secretary of State does and has nothing to do with us. I don't know. And I didn't need to know now. I just kind of meant, Lisa, when you're looking at it, like it, it needed to reference those toward one. I, I didn't see that it did. I just. Not an expert in family code. I'd have to look that up. Okay. And that's why I thought, and so the inventions. 297.2975, which is the right to register. And that would be something like I could see that you would want to express like they have to they have the right to do that. The rest of it all seemed like what the state needed to do and not what the district had any business in. Right? We don't talk about whether someone's married and if they had their license or divorce, right? It has all the details on like maybe it was removed because it was not in the purview of human resources anymore. I don't know. Yes, it's been it's been our practice for a long time. Yeah, even prior to yeah, right. Those that's things changing, and all that's still there. Because you don't have to get married; you can just you can have a partnership, right? You yes. have the marriage part, and so that the rest of that goes into all that law. I just didn't know why it's missing. Don't know that. Okay. 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 I asked the question on the last one to bring it forward as the first reading. So, um, gifts, grants, and bequests. So, can you bring that forward as the first reading? Oh, it's mm -hmm. yes. And then on this, are there more questions on this? Health and welfare benefits. Bring it forward as the first reading. Yes. So, now we should go to um, 4157 and mm -hmm. employee safety. Yes, thank you. Um, so this also replaces three other um, board policies, 4209, 4011, and 4012, um, and combines all of this um, into one policy. Any questions on this? Um, how was mold covered? Um, we have procedures for that. That we work through mm -hmm. the facilities department. There have been times when employees have alleged that you know there's mold in this area. Mm -hmm. We've brought in a company to complete testing to verify, yes. and then you know they they would be covered under workers' comp if some health issue arose. No, we, we intentionally bring that third party company in to test in front of the employee because okay. oftentimes are, it's better for them to hear from yeah. the third party. Um, mm -hmm. And what's interesting is a lot of times, the, 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 say it smells moldy, the mold doesn't have to smell. So oftentimes it's just something with maybe it's a little musty. Right. But mm -hmm. we, we always quickly address that for regular quality. So, and 
Would that be under this employee uh, uh, Yes. Well, it would be under multiple policies because so it wouldn't just affect employees. It would likely affect. Okay. Yeah. Um, and is there it deems that something's unsafe or unhealthy? Because it says, so it, no employer shall be required or permitted to be in a place of employment which is unsafe and unhealthy. Like you, it's like a teacher, uh, you know, says it's smelling here or whatever, but. It just depends on the situation. Several, yeah. We so have our annual facility inspection tool that we do for part of our master plan that's yeah. required. Uh, but then there's the, if you get an old claim, you're going to address that right away. So it's not going to wait for that inspection. So. Okay. And then um, and then the next paragraph where it says, last sentence where it says immediately, employees unable to correct an unsafe condition. Because I do love the fact that it says every employee at the top is responsible for safety. Like, that's awesome. It's great. Teacher centric. Um, but it says that he or she shall immediately report the problem to the superintendent as a dean. And so let's say it's a teacher reports to the principal. But then in the AR, will you discuss like when they'll get the information to you? Because I think it'd be that they'd be like, <coughs> somewhere has to get to you, right? Or yes, or you, or it has to get to someone, doesn't it? Mostly me. And but our employees do not have a hard time getting directly to me right away. Okay. Uh, do you need anything around that though? So that's we, we certainly right? spell it out the process of the AR, but um, okay. for the most part, I think our employees are really good about this actually. Do they have a chain in the AR? I mean, do they go to the principal first? Typically, they do. They go to the principal, um, and then the principals are always pretty good about giving to us right away. Okay. And I have one more. So it's, at this point, what we have is books. Yes, I think what we have in place books really well right now. Um, my one last question around the last paragraph: No employee shall be discharged or discriminated against. And we don't discharge or discriminate against anyone for making complaints or institute procedures or, like in general, we don't do that. So it, no, we don't. don't uh, uh, right, and so that stated. I just meant like is it boldly stated the same way in other policies that were, or as we move, it says, as we move forward, that we make sure we boldly state it. If we're boldly it it's in the all of our complaint policies. The okay. discrimination. Or the same. It retaliation. Says it over and over. It's the, the wording's not identical to this. This I think is probably verbatim out of the labor code. Mm -hmm. Right when you say it there. Okay. Yeah, and in, in every <laughs> labor code, government code, and mm -hmm. code uh, prohibition on retaliation, mm -hmm. the kind of the, the structure of one of those is the first one is is protected activity. Not every complaint would be considered protected activity. Under the law, I mean, for example, I think a teacher um, distributing emails to a bunch of people criticizing a parent wouldn't be protected, legally protected activity. So, okay. disciplining that teacher wouldn't be retaliation. So, I think you do need the, uh, the reference to specific. It is protected activity for an employee to say, "I think I'm in unsafe working conditions based on this." So that's why you uh, why you have that specific. I, I love that it's there. I just, I just wanted to. I believe that we do not allow for retaliation. That is wrong. That we stand up to anything you know, around that. And um, it's the difference between I didn't like it or I should have been protected or I was right or now I'm being disciplined. Yeah. Well, it wasn't legal in the first place for you to do what you're doing. That's a right. different story. I just want to make sure that, like, as we look forward on policies, that we just. I love it so bold. I just want to make sure that we remain bold. Um, we don't tolerate retaliation. Or violating the law. And thank you once again for all of the legal references and, and all of these and court cases and all those additional information. Any other questions on this? Can you bring it for first reading? Yes. yes. Um, so okay, 4151 and the other is on the same conversation. So uh, this replaces uh, 4403 and 4404. So, well, what happened to 42 and 9? We're just taking them in the order they were in the packet. We're going to get yeah, they gave them the packet yeah. anyway. They were, that was in a different place. Victoria just wanted to know for a page. Okay. Unfortunately, yeah. they didn't mind. In the packet, they were in lost track. In the packet, they were in a numerical order. And in the <laughs> summary, they were. It threw me off. Yeah, so I'm going to go That's why I took it apart. I know you take it apart and not work on the line so that I can just be next. Okay, so are we a merit system?
and merit system. No. Okay. Okay. We're not. That explains a lot okay. of this policy because it, it, we provide re legal reference for merit policy and for not merit pro policy. So, but I looked at other districts where they just left the merit policy policy. They didn't talk about those laws in their references. I, uh, um, I, I thought of the same thing. You're not a merit district, um, but there are uh, cross references. There, there are a lot of provisions like 45113 that's in the uh, one you looked at earlier on. Mm -hmm. on yes, it was in there. Yes. Status. Uh, 45113 has a, a specific okay. reference that. It this does. applies to districts incorporating the merit system, but then there are things like classified layoffs. Those statutes are actually in the okay. merit system right. um, right. rules, and there and there's a cross reference to them. So, so when I pop in merit system, like as on Irvine, and Irvine actually has a classified certificate, they break those up, and so it showed it under classified, but I think kind of under other yeah, that. Probably why. I can figure out like why we were mentioning merit. Oh, it's it's in the makes sense. right. The policy applies yeah, to it. Yeah. So okay. The, and wherever that language might be, it addresses it. Okay. Um. So hang on. I'm just going to pause this real quick. Pause this real quick. Um. Oh, so the one, two, three, the third paragraph, the last sentence. Certificated employees shall not be placed in different classifications on the schedule, nor paid different salaries solely on the basis of grade levels at which they teach. I'm assuming that's in the law. It's or the or the contract. I'd ask Mark, but it's, it's either law or it's a case. Or a case or something. Yeah. Um, I don't see any cases referenced. Yeah, that's uh, one of the legal references is 45028 of the Education Code, uh, which the general rule is teachers have to be placed on a salary schedule based on a uniform allowance for years of training and years of experience. Okay. That's the step and column. The years of okay. training is the column. The years of experience is the step. Okay. Um, and so generally, um, unless something is negotiated otherwise, a first grade teacher and a high school teacher with the same training and experience have to be on the same salary, salary schedule. And that's what that's uh, referring to. And is that the same for subject matter, which comes up when we're trying to negotiate? Well, it's it's based on what's negotiated. So, for example, we have a teacher salary schedule that applies to all teachers and speech pathologists. We have a, an athletic director salary schedule. We have a counseling salary schedule. That's right. Okay. So, so that's essentially, they're based on, on the same calculation, but they work different days and have different um, work years or different work days. So that's why. Okay. But if we were to hire a school nurse in high school and a school nurse, you know, school readiness, they're on the same salary. So it doesn't matter what location they're at. So it's negotiated in other districts if they want to, for instance, pay a special education teacher more because they're a yes. to blind or a female mm -hmm. teacher. Yes. Yes. The, the law didn't used to allow that, but the... Where it says, unless the board and employee organization negotiate a mutually agreeable um, salary schedule based on different criteria, that was added to 450228 probably 10 or 15 years ago. But, mm -hmm. So now you can negotiate differential salary schedule for hard to fill positions or things like that. That's but what it's I was rare. thinking about. But it's like how that it's matters, like something right. where yeah. you're signing, whatever. And is a bonus part of that? Like when teachers get a bonus for signing, mm -hmm. that's part of that negotiation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's a question legally yeah. whether a signing bonus has to be negotiated because you're technically paying it before they're an employee. Right. Um, um, okay. And so the, uh -huh. sometimes uh -huh. there's disputes in yeah. districts that want to do that. But there's no case that's saying hard and fast one way or other, so we're just open. No, okay. It's still a, a the only the only other the only other uh, <clears throat> comment I have is around legal reference. There's two legal references from the other ones. This is that weren't in here, which was Ed Code four five one two seven, which is about uh, work week yes. and Labor Code five ten covers work week as well, but. Uh, 45127 is more current than 510, which I mentioned in this policy. 45127 is on board policy. Okay. 
All right, perfect. Thanks, Mike. And these might be really hard questions that then get right. I don't know which way it goes. But that's about work we did. It's similar. It has a couple things about merit pay that was different. That's why I was asking about merit pay. I know we're not, but, but when Mark talked about the crossover in classified information, that could be why that 45127 was on the disorder policy. No, it's on the deleted. It's on the deleted one. They're on the deleted one. Oh, okay. I don't have mine. The two are highlighted. And I don't have an answer today. I just feel like if they should be, if it's helpful to have them there, when we go back to negotiate or talk about something like an AR, then something This is about compensation. It looks like. Four five one two seven is more about the work week, like hours. Mm -hmm. Would probably fit more. Of, it, it's actually referenced I think right. overtime. But so, yeah, labor code yeah, five ten overtime compensation length like of work yeah. day is it's also alternative so. schedule. So that's that's the only reason I'm like I don't know if it's helpful. It talks about merit pay, so that's what made me think, or or not merit pay, but merit merit districts, which it's has to classify. Yes. Has to be classified. So that's why I didn't know if you needed a mention or not. And then also policy 45309, which is about training stating, which I'm still confused by, but um, more. Uh, at least as an expert, I don't even know that. That's not 4404. 5309 is one of the cross reference. That's a merit. That's a merit. But, so it's, that, but it relates to layoffs. For classified, right? Yes. Yeah, see, that that's why I was just. I would say Irvine was a good example, except Irvine talked about the superintendents and all of this. It was all the so it wasn't like, because I was trying to figure out what merit pay meant in this issue. Merit system. Oh, it's not merit it's, pay. Merit, it's merit system. It's, it's more it's, of a, it does say merit system. Yeah, it's more of a structure, like a civil service uh, yeah. commission. Person, it, there's a personnel commission, a separate three-person commission yeah. that hears discipline, that does reclassifications. And then there's much more in a merit district. You might uh, uh, detect my preference for non merit. Have we worked in both? <laughs> but yes. there, there are. Um, uh, there's a lot of structure where there are promotional exams. You're not allowed to hire. There's an eligibility list, and you have to pick from um, a certain. You know, uh, um, I think usually the top three on an eligibility list. And then there's often. In a merit district, there's a lot of ambiguity on the interplay between collective bargaining, which is the district negotiating with the union, and the personnel commission and the things that they do and what has to be negotiated and what the personnel commission has the authority to do and not to do. And so it's it's a lot it's more straightforward when it's just the district and the, the and in, in this case CSEA that negotiated agreement and uh, the non merit than having that system. Yeah. And it seemed complicated. I just, the, I, that's why I was just confused. I was like, I don't think we do that, but so much legal reference to it. Yeah. That's why. All right. Any questions? Any more questions on employee compensation? Bring it forward for Sweetie. Yep. So now we're going to 4216, the Wage Pairing Permanent Status. This is a new policy, we didn't have it before, and it pertains solely to classified employees. Um, and it essentially just defines the um, proba probationary period, which we've defined it here consistently with our contract. Okay, I have another merit pay quick question. So we have not been adopted for Article 6, right? Whatever that is that talks about it in this policy. So I went through right all as I could. Article 6 of what? I don't know in this ed code, I think that's part of merit pay is Article 6. Merit, merit system. System, system, I get damn paid. System, merit right. systems, Article 6. Okay. Right. Well, that's why some of those legal references were missing, is because they were just about. They're just for merit districts. Yeah, and so I went to different districts to try to understand what merit system was. Right, that's okay. Um, the only thing, I, the only thing I, I don't, it is nine months probationary, is that what was in our contract? That's our consistent with our contract. Okay. I saw lots of various ways. Yes. But the end code says no longer than a year. So six months to a year is the. Ours used to be six standard. months. And we, uh, several years, I think, even before 
before I got here, it's changed to up to nine months. Because there were the six months plus it could be superintendent does the additional six months. There's all kinds of different mm -hmm. language, but most of them working towards the year mark mm -hmm. or adding other stuff like drug testing in or other. Mm -hmm. It was interesting what they were adding in if they were giving a shorter one. So but they I think they had most say. Uh, uh, Fullerton, I think, oh, was, okay. yeah, was, I, was trying to figure, I was trying to figure out merit systems. I kept going out there to look at, so I think it's number of references, right? So I kept going to look at other okay. districts to try to understand. Um, there was one on the very last um, paragraph, the second last paragraph, after uh, it's a classification from which they were promoted. Mm -hmm. On Fullerton, Irvine, and Carmel, or Palo Alto, or they did have only if the position still exists. They probably negotiated that. I, I was like, how much is in the contract versus how much is the Okay. Yeah, the Ed Code says that. The Ed Code says what's in our contract. Okay. Okay. I thought that was enough. Do we ever run into that as a machine? We've had a, a situation where we've run into this. Would that be a language change that we would that we can talk about in here? Sorry. That would fall under negotiations. Any questions on this probationary permit status? Thank you for the first reading. Okay. And, and I would add, just for clarification to the bills, if the position still exists, it's different than if the position is vacant. Mm -hmm. um, if the position still exists, um, but somebody is sitting in the, is in that position, right. then that person would need to be laid off. So that the person that. could return. Um, so it only be like he got rid of that position altogether, right? Yeah, and and, and when that's negotiated, it's because well, we um, basically already did a kind of a sort of layoff of that position. Somebody got promoted, then we eliminated the position, yes. so there's nowhere for that person to go back to. I think it didn't meet the probationary yeah. requirements for that. Okay, I am grateful for your. We don't have that in our contract. Do we need that? That would be a contract issue with this. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we move on to 5113 absences and excuses. And this is replace. This is you. Yeah. 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 Thank you, President <laughs> Vickers. All right. So there was a new law, AB 2289, which addressed pregnant and parenting students. Mm -hmm. In that law, it amended the definition of immediate family. Specifically, instead of mother, father, it's parent guardian. So that ticked off the update of this of this particular AR. Which, which one? We're on 5113. Yes, 5113. Yes, yes, I know. Mm -hmm. But the definition of for parenting and uh, pregnant pupils ticked off the AR update oh, on this. So okay. I went back and checked the BP. That had also been updated. So okay. I'm kind of describing the story of how why I bring this forward to okay. you. Our previous board policy for 5008 did address um, student absences for religious purposes. However, I feel that this piece, I'd like to recommend that this particular sentence in red um, allow us to delete 2000, uh, 5008. This particular uh, 5113 was adopted in 2017, but it did not have the red sentence. Mm -hmm. Um, and we will, of course, amend our AR to go into the new link. Yeah. This may be so happy. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Mark doesn't have a comment. So we adopted, we adopted this policy in November of 2017. We did. Mm -hmm. But the one that you have for deletion, we'd already deleted it then. No. No, we had still. It's still. Oh, so we yeah, had it as the same. That's a specific one just for religious purposes. Correct. Because I thought it was interesting that it seemed like it was a contradiction in that. <laughs> With the four four hours and four months, mm -hmm. four days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that wasn't. Okay. So we've just kept this on the books. Right. We have. We're interested. Any questions on this policy? Bring forward to the first oh. reading. Oh, wait, we have one question. On the last thing, which isn't something that's changing, but what, is it, what does it mean in that last paragraph? The board shall, by resolution, enter into minutes, approve reasonable methods that may be used to verify student absences to illness and quarantine or quarantine. Like what? What are we doing, Mr. Jason? What is the board doing? Then? So 
this might be an extreme circumstance. For example, when I was principal, so I flew went through my school. There was a discussion for classrooms were under quarantine by the county, so it talked. I would, I would, like, like, a like in my experience, my proposal, that there was a discussion about do we need to bring this forward? Does the board need to act on this? Okay. Um, since it was such a drastic uh, event that was happening in my particular school setting at the time, that that's what comes to mind. On that. Okay. But I think, Mark, is it is it something similar to that situation? Like if there was a measles outbreak yeah. or something. Okay. Okay. That's what that. Okay. Would that also be covered? I I know I had a student traveled in China and came back, was healthy, but other parents did not want him in class because of the Chinese birth. And so the principal told him he could not come to class. Is that? Well, we typically don't quarantine a student unless we have working with Orange County Health Department. So they're the ones that traditionally take over any sort of a quarantine situation. So obviously this is a new um, uh, policy for us that provides some clarity around the process. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we we had the measles outbreak more recently. That was we think a lot of lead to be taken by the agency because they're the ones that are actually the facilitators of that. We would not keep a student out of school uh, unless we had So this would give the principal some something to go by and <coughs> say to the other Less parents, I can't keep him out if we so there's no specific, you know, yeah, there's no help. So it was just that he had been in place where no. There's no health requirement unless, again, we received information from the health department that would lead us to a different reasoning purpose. But then it was also, I, the parent asked for work then, and I was told if I took work to him, I wouldn't be allowed to teach the class. Because no, I, I, can't, I can't speak right, to we can't this assess specific situation. But. But, but on this, what are we asking that the board shall, by resolution, so if, so if something happened like a measles outbreak, then the board could say you could all those kids can then be verified as they were absent? But you, your method, it's the method by which you're excusing. So you could say simply, you know, we're not going to require parents to provide a note because we know that the health department is excluding them from school. So that's what that means. Okay. I was school. looking for the example. So, so what was it for me? But we, we, sense. we didn't do that. The, the most recent one, the parents just simply called them in. They, we knew they were excluded. The parents let us know. We knew how long they were going to be out. And we worked with them to provide them work while they were out so that they didn't fall behind. Okay. So, you know, they just couldn't come to school because the healthcare agency had, had said as such. So, uh, okay. Could in that That's resolution, logical. like if, I don't know if kids still, schools, teachers, kids still work towards like a perfect attendance or not? I don't know where that's no. going. The, you that's could, the board couldn't say it doesn't go against our perfect attendance no, or something. No, we don't do perfect attendance because that's, that's, that's very I, I know, I, just, I was trying to think, I was trying to think, I was trying to think that. things no. that the board would be doing in that resolution. No. Okay. It's simply to say, it, the resolution is simply, here's how we will allow you to verify the student absence, because by law, we have to have verification of student absences, so that when we get our audit, we have that in writing. So whether it's through some kind of paper, or whether the board says we simply are going to allow the healthcare agency to provide us a list, and we will consider that as confirmation that these students are excluded from school, but it, it's really around the method by which the uh, verification of the absence, whether okay. through quarantine or illness. It's, it's very specific. Right. Quarantine that's or illness, illness. And that's yeah. specific to the reasoning behind I just thought being kids being excluded this, for right. uh, communicable diseases. Either. Okay. So lice is quarantine. Well, the, the rules have changed related to, to lice. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay, that is very helpful. Sorry, I didn't get the weeds to get there. I just couldn't understand what you were. Yeah, it's really you were it's asking, It was asking of us. The policy is asking of us. Right. I just have a quick question with what we're adding to this policy and based on parent comment we had a few meetings over in default, mm -hmm. then our AR will make it clear to staff that there's not anything that penalizes a student if they're out for religious days. Correct, correct. We're not calling specifically that you can't assign work on certain no, I'm holidays. Saying that's However, correct. we did we have setting out a best practice that okay. and, you know, one, we will let them know of, of the high holidays and other holidays uh, that just they should be aware of and know that they will have students missing and if at all possible try to refrain from scheduling a test you know assigning big projects or whatever it might be um but yes so that's part of the administrative regulation but it still ties into the family personal choice on the parent and family part thank you and I bring it forward to the first reading sure. mm -hmm. um 5127 graduation ceremonies and activities thank you so mm -hmm. ab uh 1248 
um, was a resolution in September 2018. It asked districts to update their um, ceremony board policy with uh, with regard to tribal or, or religious or cultural regalia. It spells it out in the um, in particular statute. Uh, talks about adornment and cultural, and it's more in addition to, not in replacement of, but we call that small change out under conduct at graduation ceremonies as recommended, and we'll see it. Training teachers. I know I wasn't trained during this, but 
you weren't here. <laughs> um, when students are experiencing grief, bereavement, how do you deal with that? Yes, so right now the, le the legislation calls for 7th through 12th graders to uh, have suicide uh, teachers of students and staff. So our training is 6th through 12th, but what we've noticed in a conversation over the last year is that our elementary teachers want to have awareness as well. So we've really brought the conversation to mm -hmm. awareness and prevention, mm -hmm. and that's an annual training at secondary in particular. To mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, I think a lot of teachers don't feel confident mm -hmm. when, you know, a child's grandparent dies or their, mm -hmm. you know, a member whose father's died. And what is, what should you say, what mm -hmm. shouldn't you, how do you, how you And our sites are so well resourced with your, with board support um, to make sure that students get support, even if a teacher does not know what to do. But yes, we're also because Yeah, yeah I went to some training that just gave me some exact things to look at and say. I think Jeff also went to that training maybe. But, um, but I don't think that's, now that we, I don't think we can speak for all teachers. I don't think that's Counselors, <clears throat> from my experience, and having had um, a child with many years of suicidal ideation, I don't think that is the case. I think our teachers, I think the teachers are incredibly are simple. I mean, the, I mean, I think we have pretty much the empathy issue with, but I think to me it would be more key if the teacher is seeing real distress in that student that they would present on to research. And that they also <laughs> communicate with the parent that they're seeing that in the classroom so that they get, so they share that information and how impacted the student is. I mean, and I think, you know, I. I don't think they hold on to that or whatever or get stopped by it. I think they, there are some resources for them to reach out to if they themselves don't know. And but I, I just on a simple basis, I mean, over the years with my kids, I saw teachers that, you know, they, they did exactly the right thing. Just basically it was mm -hmm. the empathy. And that was not just people that was pets because for young children, that's, right. that's a big deal also. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And I think, it could be the snail that died on the field that day, right? That day. I'm it's curious, curious, like, that could be it. <laughs> but you're right. We it goes it. through all the, the things I saw, go through all the things where, you know, so say your pet died and it's old, but you don't say, oh, they're in a better place now, or, you know, they're probably not in pain anymore. It goes through specific things that you shouldn't say and specific things that are okay to say. And the other kids will say, <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, kids will say, whatever the kids say, but hopefully, eventually, they model. But I think there's just, so just much to know. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about suicide. Yeah, it's, it's we, we're part of this. Suicide in the head catheter. So, just want to make sure we're back to the, this is the. Well, she heard a question was regarding grief. Right. So. The training specifically. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but it's, it's around suicide. Yeah. This particular thing is around suicide. And then we're going to review this every five years. Yes. I, I thought five years was a long time. Yes, so did I. <laughs> Can we do it sooner? Or you're going to do it, you're going to do it as necessary. So sooner is the term. If there are changes, it will come before five years. Yes. Yeah. Any questions? First review. Okay. Uh, 6145.2, athletic competition. Yes, so you adopted this board policy mm -hmm. in 2015. Um, recent legislation has require districts to update written emergency action plans and sudden cardiac arrest illness. Mm -hmm. Pam and Lance have worked very closely with Chad uh, to update our procedures. Uh, I want to call out for you that it is also, uh, students are able to participate consistent, consistent with gender identity as well, um, which doesn't exactly align to the written emergency action plan and sudden cardiac arrest, but it's in alignment with our other work protocols. Thank you for being so thorough and catching for the title of that in. Um, and was it the law change too on um, the racial discrimination that mass cause things like that? Is that a whole thing? That was for okay. That's awesome. Okay. Any questions on this? Um, so let's just read it. 6145.6 International Exchange. Oh, where is the, where are those? They're all over the office. The one that pulled one, um, I think there's two in high school. Okay, I think you're trying to remember the word. 
And, and those can be used on employees too. Something else, but they're not just yes. so safe. Let's make it a safe environment. For visitor, everyone. they can be used. So visitor, yeah. there's safe environment that needs a defect. Yep, they're very intuitive. They walk you through the entire process. They do. Process. It's just yeah. yes. Yeah, reads off the instructions. It so speaks to you. We have been trained with that. No? It's really simple. Yeah, it yeah. tells you. You could be trained with that. Actually. It tells you because it tells you if you don't need to do it. It's That's part awesome. of it. You hook it up. Right? You hook it up and then it'll it does yeah. its thing. Is that in the start training? I know that's mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So a little bit of timeline here. So we adopted our current board policy 5043 in 2010. Gamut's replacement that is current language on here was 2004. So we we've we've adjusted our policy to align to Gamut recommendations with CSE AI um, around best practice. So that's why most of it is lined out, but it does talk about our international student exchange programs and our, how we support students. And can I ask, just in the page 48, the first paragraph on that page, kind of talking about funds and stuff, and to, to trying to understand. So the exchange student comes from the whole year and they enroll into school, and then they make something and all of that, like all of everything that they are calls working on. They pay the actual cost. The actual cost of being in school there. So whatever it is that we like, like the actual cost that we already have teachers and stuff. So there's no real cost because they just kind of fit in and we already have it. Or the actual cost of what we assign per student. Per student. Okay. And then if one of our students goes overseas, they don't take that money with them from the district no. to go. And that's all in law, or that's in our parts? I'm sharing that. No, it's in, it's in law. That's in law. I think every, every school district calculates a, a, a per student cost. And I just want to share about like, based on your cost. I think right. prior year, probably P2 enrollment. Yeah. So okay. it's, a, it's an estimate, but okay. everybody uses mm -hmm. the same formula. But I was thinking, like, we're, we're community funded, but with the KDA, right, we're kind of trend, you know, your kid comes and they get more dollars. And so, so I was like, I kind of, it just in mind. There's no portability of those dollars. Thought of, or, I thought the state doesn't write you a check and say, here, <laughs> I, take I, 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 I never really thought it through. I just kind of thought, well, I was reading, I was like, oh, but would it work better if they had to pay? Doesn't the money go with them? Or something? Okay. okay. Yeah, they go to a program that's specific for them. Oh, is there actually programs called? Mm -hmm. so, okay. I only do the summer thing for so is this um do we have students here right now in this four or five yes. um but they have uh, so for example there's a they pay we are not at this time receiving so this changes that okay. so uh for example a company reached out from Germany recently and Chad said we're reviewing our policy here's the amount mm -hmm. that you would have to pay that's a company service. uh yes uh it's embedded by this uh, organization um, so they're thinking about it now, for example, if that's a change for us. Right, makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. And the only thing I didn't see um, a legal reference on this one versus the other one was um, United States Code Title 8, 118 for foreign students. And Mark, I don't know if it needs to be there, doesn't need to be there, but it just wasn't under this legal reference. Page I'm looking at the old, the old yeah, policy, the, old one, so the one being at... deleted. Yeah, and I just go through to see if all the like, references are the same. If not, I go read them when I have time. I just kind of start around time, so I'm just asking on the ones I didn't get to go back and check. What was that again? Eight USC. Uh, one one eight four. And it's foreign students. And so, if it needs to be, they're great. And that makes sense but I have to reach out to me because I did a summer thing asking all the time about what context the measure is. Are for that answer? Okay. So we bring it to the first reading? Yes. Okay, 6146.4 differential graduation and competency standards. New policy for us. This is a new policy for us, President Vickers. Uh, so we at this time have a board policy around 
high school graduation. Mm -hmm. This is for this policy would be for students on a path of receiving a certificate of educational completion, so students on a modified program. Mm -hmm. For a little bit of context, at this time we have six students in high school. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Questions on this? Yes, we have a green tab. That's a green tab. You don't have to write my green tab. It's also exciting. Sorry, I'm going to ask the first reading. Now we move to some more bylaws. So we'll just review 9200 minutes of board member authority. I'm sorry, Mark, I'm going to say your name a lot. Okay. That's what he's here for. I know. So, um, so the governing board recognizes the board is the unit of authority over the district and that the board member has no individual authority. And so my questions are really going to be around like, what are the legal basis behind all these different things that we're agreeing to? Because I know they're all in there. And I remember going through and looking at this from the first one from the board member and the training. But I kind of thought while we're here together, you walked us through because I think some of us is where our biggest misunderstandings are. Mm -hmm. And it'd be really helpful to be able to sentence by sentence on a couple of these policies and really get the understanding of them. Um, you know, board members shall hold the education of students of a partisan principles, groups, interests, and personal interests. And I know I've heard these, and you mentioned Brown Acts, and you mentioned Law, and if you know where they actually fall, or right where they put laws are referencing within all the little places back there. Yeah, some of these I'll, I'll, uh, oh, <coughs> I'll start with this. Some of these are, some of the provisions in 9220 are based on. Um, We're at 9200, right? 9200. Okay, I just want to make sure. They are based on. Provisions of code, um, for example, the one in the first paragraph. There's a there's a provision of Ed Code that says the board acts through a majority vote of its membership. Right. So that kind of frames that um, that's how a board acts is through a majority vote, not through uh, individuals. So some of them are code based. Some of them are more aspirational. They're they're this is how we collectively as a board, which is a different thing than the five individuals, right. but collectively as a board, this is how we have decided through uh, adopting rules for our own governance that we expect one another to uh, okay. carry out that role as a board member. Um, so, um, and then some of them are a mix. I would say the individual members of the board shall not exercise any administrative responsibility with respect to the schools that in, in the uh, beginning of the second paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, that's both aspirational and I would say it's it's an accurate statement of law also. Being elected to a board of education doesn't give that individual any more authority at a school site or in a district office than any parent or other citizen. They have the same right but not uh, an additional right. Um, so uh, that would be an example of, um, of both of them. And, I, and I'll say, uh, after the last meeting, um, Jan and I spoke, and um, I'm working on a legal opinion to address some of the things that, um, that are invoked here based on some statements that were made at, that, at the last board meeting. Um, and, and I won't go into detail on that, but that's something that will be. Um, so you're going to provide that back here. OK. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I also looked at, I know, uh, D, you handed out a, a list mm -hmm. of questions. Um, and here's where I get to sound like a, a lawyer, <laughs> um, which I know can be frustrating. Um, board bylaw, I think the next one you're looking at does have the statement that board bylaws, board policies have to be interpreted consistent with law. So you can't take away through a bylaw. Um, rights that an individual board member has. You can't take away from employees rights that they have through a board policy on personnel or students. So that's that's a, a global issue um, or a, a, a global proposition. But when you, 
Um, and I was thinking of some examples. There's a reference to that, and then there's a series of questions under it. The first question is, can a board member conduct fact-finding or investigation um, separately and individually? Well, the answer to that is, if the board member is exercising a right that he or she has under the law, then yes, they can. Um, but can a board member in doing that demand information from staff at a school site, for example? No, they, uh, a parent doesn't have that right. Um, uh, individual board members don't have that right. Um, can they share confidential personnel or student information? No, there are legal restrictions on that. So, can they access those? Um, can they access it? Right. Um, well, generally, no. Yeah, a, uh, um, uh, an individual board member using student records, for example, um, the standard under state and federal law for pupil access to pupil records is a, an employee with a reasonable need to know that information in pupil records. Board members wouldn't fall into that category. Um, so that would be an example. You have uh, uh, contracts, um, your employment contracts for your administrators. They incorporate the rules and regulations of board into the contract. So now you have a contractual obligation vis-a-vis -vis that employee to comply with these. Um, and that's something that the board has uh, bound itself um, through a contract. Same thing with a collective bargaining agreement. I was looking at the LaBufa contract has a, an article on complaints. Mm -hmm. So if a board member receives a complaint about an employee and considers that to be significant enough that it needs to be investigated, um, then that contract has to be followed. And so mm -hmm. that's why you, you know, the, these things uh, endorse the idea that those are taken to either the superintendent or the assistant superintendent for HR for handling those are the people who day to day, week to week, implement the collective bargaining agreement and supervise employees um, of the district. So those are some, that's just that first question. Right, so, that's what I mean. That's um, what, and you go through each one of those questions, the answer is gonna be the lawyer answer. It depends on the right. specific circumstances. Um, and, uh, um, well, and if we're, if we're talking about these questions for the school board ones, and this is a question, it's easier for you. Yeah, that's what, that's what I just, I just think it clarifies these, these questions, right? So that, yeah. yeah. That, uh, I think seven and eight are the, the areas of greatest misunderstanding. Well, six is a non is a non question because all of our votes are reported. Even yeah, the closed session right. votes that are reported out. Are, everyone always knows who votes yeah. out. That's in, the, that's in the minutes. You didn't have a copy of this. Oh, okay. Yeah, I spent a lot of time looking over that. And. Uh, well, no, I there's lots of definitions and yeah, no defining. It should have been the sort of the information writing Individual research. I think there's so much that needs to be defined on what an example of what underlying are. It seemed to me when I looked at that was that where do we define? We all have the same individual rights. Mm -hmm. Everyone does. But when we join the board, we have in my in my view, the responsibility to the organization that rises above that. Mm -hmm. And so anything that I do in, in regards to these questions, I have to ask myself that the question, how, how is this supporting the, the district? And that's the organization I'm responsible to. So I may have, and I, because I, I, I early on learned that as one board member, you know, I, if I don't have support of two others, the greatest idea in the world that I have isn't going to fly. Mm -hmm. And that goes, you know, way back to, you learn that quickly as a board member, that you don't join the board and then get your way. So it, it really becomes to me the, the commitment to the organization and what I might do as an individual if that's going to damage the organization. So if I say, don't move on, don't move forward, don't go with the majority and move the district forward, in my view, then I'm doing damage to the district. And so... That all of the all of these, as I look at them, except six, which is not um, relevant, fit into that category as an over as an overarching thing. 
And so that's because, as you said, I mean, it could be depends. So depends means where does that responsibility lie? And I get into integrity and ethics and the, the responsibility, and that's big to me because the organization is above my individual rights. Yeah, I could I could mouth off in every media and say some really outrageous things. Because people over the years have said to me, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you listen to people come in and berate and demean and you don't say anything. I said, that's, that's the responsibility that I have. Because it would just make it worse. And it isn't, it is appropriate, it isn't the place for it. So, you know, this really um, is a bit distressing because I think it calls into the question of the difference between your personal right to do whatever and you're over to me, you're above that, your obligation to the organization, which is to not do harm. Besides, providing best education for students, which is really, and as I got into this too, another issue, a side issue, that it just popped into my mind because we've heard this a lot about, that we somehow represent people that specifically check the box by our names when they voted. And of course, we really don't know who those people are. We only know a, a general number. But we also are responsible to represent our constituency of people who have parents who didn't vote. Mm -hmm. It's not just the voters or who they might have voted for. We represent everyone in our whole constituency. And we have, our voter registration isn't that high. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people who send their kids to school, so they didn't vote for any of us. I was going to say, in the first 100 days and, and all the other trainings you get, and in 9200, the first paragraph, it's like, that we shall hold the education of students above partisan principles, right, groups, interests. And I think the school board, I agree with everything you said, Jan, and that, and I feel the same way. I think city council and school boards are very different. School boards uniquely different in that none of these professionals sitting here I like you. They don't like disagreement. They don't want conflict. They didn't join education to have people accuse them of harm or that they joined this very noble position that is not was deemed and valued in a way that I would like in a utopia for it to be deemed and valued. Well, you know, about the Wall Street broker or lawyer or anything else. And they join it to humbly care for other people's kids. Right, and so it's not city council where if you go in and you say something degrading to city council, staff about parking or something, I'm not even sure that parking person hears it, right, or whatever it is, right, but it's not, it's not really going to affect their job, or maybe it will, maybe they'll get more tickets. But it's, I just feel education, educators are in such different human beings. Um, and I'm always in awe of all of them that teach and all of them, right. I just don't think it's a place, and so I went back and I decided I was going to read Ed Code. I read Ed Code. I'm like, how did Ed Code start? When did it restart? When did they restart? And so, this is great. D, I suggest you go read, uh, I'll send you the link, but where you can go look at all the Ed Code, it breaks all down. It's 36 pages, or whatever, printed of just the links to click through to the Ed Code. It's 36 pages of links. It's fleshy. Yes. Keeping track of all of that. <laughs> I was like, oh. I have new appreciation for words. But um, section two, so the very first section, what they're talking about, and within the section, very, the second thing they talk is that the code establishes the law. The first thing it said is education code shall be called ed code. That's the first thing. Second thing was the code establishes the law of this state respecting the subjects to which it relates, and its provisions and all proceedings under it are to be liberally constructed with a view to affect its objectives, which is later on it talks about students' education, to promote justice. And which is kind of that higher place. Like, I feel that sometimes your questions are kind of like, I know I'm a parent, but I want to go out and go to this party and not take care of my kids, kind of thing. I want to. I know I have his responsibilities, but I don't want to hold them. I want to go over here and do what I want to do. And no one can tell me I can't go do it. This is a higher office. It's not a lower office. You're accepting the responsibility of all the employees and all the students in this district. And these questions um, seem more manipulative, like trying to set something up or all of these can be answered if you read bylaws. 
and that you can read the law. Don't read the bylaw, but read the law and the cases and all the case law and all the uh, attorney general opinions and all that before you accuse people of something because you don't have a right to hold anyone's complaint. You have no way of resolving a complaint or holding a complaint. Yeah. They also have to go because there's a liability. There's a liability in this district. When you hold that, someone tells you something they think, now the district is going to solve it. They don't understand where you would fall in the district and that you have no authority to solve it. You're not a teacher. You cannot I solve it. I understand that I can't solve complaints. And I don't say that I think. I beg to differ. Your comment, I have a list of 100 people, and I agree that all your comments are that you think you're solving them. I don't think I'm solving them, I'm listening to them, which I think is part of my job as an elected official is to listen to people. And so then now it's what we're passive. seeing in print is right. that people are saying that's what you do. Right. So and if you listen and don't take action by passing on, it's the action we're concerned about. Then we are a great liability. And part of what I would like to have on that 200 is a reference to the superintendent administrator's contracts because in their contracts, we give authority. And it could just be just superintendent Mark, maybe a guy, whether it's bigger contracts or just superintendent, but but we really have that information. If you just go to the contract and look, you know, oh, all, all that section 2000, all of that authority is there in that contract. And we do not, we are not members. And we have to figure out some way to get along and govern together. And what board bylaws that you have voted for over and over and over and over for are the way we say we're going to govern together. And you vote for it, and then you do the opposite. Governing together to me does not mean agreeing with everything. Of course, you don't. Have it to doesn't agree. With it. I 100% agree. But I once, agree. but once it takes, once it moves forward, then my big point is it's incumbent upon us to support that. Mm -hmm. And so part of what this says is that you know you can continue to say vehemently why you were opposed to something, and so that's. For the good of the organization, that's not constructive. Once that question is answered, once the opposition is stated in a meeting, which of course it can be, then we move on. And so we've got issues it. now that are festering out there because of that, the idea that somehow if we bring something back, it'll have a different outcome. And also, if we do something that we later considered wasn't good, we should turn it back. I mean, but just because but, we did something it, one time, and more and more, more yeah, that's if the majority justice. decides to bring it back. For me, it's justice. always majority rules. I respect everybody's right to their vote. They have a right to their vote. We don't demean or bully anyone for a different vote. It's your vote. And you can feel completely passionate about your principles and that vote. But each of us feel equally passionate. And when it's reflected that the majority rules is bullying or mean, I find that really unprofessional. You, you can disagree with this, you have a few times, that's fine. But the majority rules this board, it is a board of five people. I don't think that it's bullying if the majority rules. I've never said that. That's how it's been portrayed out in the public. Well, so that, is um, not me. That, that I have never said that. Okay, it just concerns me, and my biggest concern is Individual board members do not have the authority to resolve complaints, period, in 9200. When you make a statement that you are aware of complaints, 100, which is very bothersome to me, it is beholden to you, and you know this from being a teacher, that you must report those complaints to the right authorities, and then we let go because they have processes in place. But to, I'm concerned about comments like repercussions or retaliation. There's a lot of that, Peggy. I disagree with you, Dee. I believe that people can come to our meeting and state a different opinion. There's no repercussion. The repercussion might be interpreted that we did not vote in favor of their policy the way they hoped. That's not a repercussion. That's a resolution they disagreed with. But I want to clearly really state what she said. That was not what she said. She said that their students, our administrators, and our teachers are then harming their students in some negative way. That should be reported. So. That should be 100% reported. Yes. But that has happened. 
And have you reported it each time? Each yeah. of the hundred specific oh, the hundred the hundred people? Many of them of the the latest thing were people that of course the December eleventh meeting was over the holidays. So I'm at lots of holiday events, whether it's with the women's club, the art museum, the garden club, my book club, the gym, and everybody is saying, oh, Dee, congratulations on being board president, because it was written in the paper and everybody thought that would happen. And I had to say, oh, no, that didn't happen. I, you know. And explain to them what happened. Explain to them. So the board majority you decided it. something different and did not break the bylaw. You could actually decided. have explained to them that you came into that meeting and blindsided everyone in the room okay. because okay. that was not your position from the year before, and no one assumed that your position would have changed. I seriously doubt that you shared that with all the people that you went to. That is how I felt. That unfortunately that would not be true for me. I'm not going to share that when that's not true for me. But well, the that's majority what voted. That's what right. you, yeah, the majority did not, not break a bylaw, and that is true. The majority made in a decision that you dis disagree with the opinion is your right. But to reframe it with things that are not factual does not support the board as a professional or organization, and that's what bothers me. The majority decided they did not break a bylaw, and you you related in a different fashion. If you didn't break the bylaw, then why did you change it? Said it is the intent of the board for each member to rotate through the positions. As a guideline. Wait, what, as a guideline. So, we don't as a guideline. So, it should, work, it should come up in a workshop and then, like, we're all for what we're supposed to be talking about, aren't we? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Because okay. we went to these questions. We went to, so, so, back to the questions then here, or in tie of 9200. I'm not sure if we can really talk about these questions here in this way, but. Um, Right. Can we do that, or is it against the, the Well, Mark was tying it with, into the 9200. Okay. I just want to answer a process question on 9200. In the past, you, you told me change his or to there, so I'm doing that on anything I find Thank there. Thank you. Is that okay. still yeah. the yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So we, we, And I think all of that list of questions relates to limits of board member authority, where okay. the line is. Okay. I don't think it's necessary or productive to go through each one of those questions in this meeting okay. to answer them because generally the answer is going to be the same. It mm -hmm. depends. Um, is a, you know, there's a, uh, from the famous uh, Tinker uh, Supreme Court case, students wearing black armbands, right, right. um, public school students and staff don't shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. Board members don't shed their constitutional rights when they get elected. But just like with student speech, it is often very dependent on very specific facts on whether the disruption is a, is the substantial disruption that may occur is enough to suppress that speech versus a student having a right to speak. Same with staff members. With each one of those, you can't just give a blanket yes or no answer. It's always it depends. Um, and um, and like I said with some of them, you know, the it depends is you have contractual limitations that not just your policies, but you've incorporated them into contracts. You have legal obligations. I would agree, I would say to any of you, if somebody comes to you and complains that they're being retaliated against or something like that, the Laguna Beach Unified School District now knows of that allegation right. because of your role. And there are legal obligations to follow up and do something about that. So um, you can't, if, if something is reported to you, just like if something is reported to a school site principal, um, that there, there are legal obligations, or, or can be, depending on the facts of it, um, uh, legal obligations separate and apart from for policies and contracts that are immediately invoked because of the fact that you're a board member. So, um, right. So if it sits with you as a board member and it doesn't go any further and they, they in turn sue for sexual harassment or then we're all in trouble. Things you mentioned, then we get sued. Do board members ever then personally are in jeopardy of an impunitive way or jail time like they are in public request acts or, well, or, or other things? Um, are we always a group, or can one person be singled out if they were actually the person that led to that happening? Or do we have do to individual them? board members get sued? Yes. Do individual employees get sued? Yes. 
Um, usually, any liability runs to the organization, um, and, and because of um, you know under state law, it, unless a an employee is acting outside the course and scope of employment. So the school board members then they can the be school personally board. liable. But an, an example of that is if a, uh, a supervisor is sexually harassing a subordinate employee, the courts have said that's outside the school, course, and school, course and scope of employment. It's not promoting the interest of the organization, and that person can be individually liable. Somebody who um, falls into the category of knew or should have known and failed to respond mm -hmm. accordingly, that usually the liability falls to the organization. But that doesn't mean that there's more cynicism coming out. Plaintiff's attorneys, they sue every individual they can think of so that that weight is on the individuals. Um, and a lot of times, the, it's strategically, in my opinion, to try to get the individuals to um, promote a settlement because they don't like being sued. They don't like to have to check yes on that refinance off of application that says, are you currently being sued, or things like that. So uh, individuals get sued all the time in state and federal uh, lawsuits. Uh, most of the time, liability, if there is any close to the organization. So there's a request to add language regarding the superintendent's contract into this file. So, so what happens under legal reference? Under, 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 I under legal reference. I'm answering her. Oh. Yeah, so under legal reference, can she put superintendent contract under legal reference? Um, or would you have to tie it into the actual wording somewhere? I mean, we could tie it into... I don't know, if it, because um, uh, normally a, a, a current employment contract is not listed as a legal reference. Okay. I, I look, your, uh, and this is typical with a lot of school districts, I haven't looked at your teacher contracts, but... Uh, teachers okay. probably sign a contract when they start. Use your uh, template, so. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, like your school site administrator contracts, teacher contracts, right. they typically say um, this contract is subject to the rules and regulations of the state, uh, state and federal law and, and the State Board of Education and the, the district. So they incorporate uh, that, that into it. So I don't know if I. You don't have to make add that in way. here. Um, there might be a way to add. Um, into yeah. so the other ten. question that might be a long time, okay. but, it's, but it's further than just the superintendent. So, yeah. as far as the group or the individual, an individual board member makes comments in a meeting, or I guess also outside a meeting, but in a meeting that calls into question performance of superintendent or other administrative employees. And the, that person decides that those comments have done damage to their professional reputation. And so is that then going to come as a district, a suit against the district, or against the individual who actually made the statement? In other words, are we, do we have to take on the burden of that as, a, as the whole board? Is that how it would come? Or if you censure? Because then I think it's, I think then it becomes more of a challenge for us to make sure that that we get cooperation with what the essence of this policy is. The uh, um, I'm trying to remember the, the case. I think it might be one of the Brown Act uh, public speaking cases um, that's out there. But the and I'll, and I'll get to a specific answer to your question. But the um, one of the things that was emphasized in that case is when a board sits in open session, it's sitting as a le legislative body, as a policy-making body. When it's sitting as an employer, that's in closed session. Mm -hmm. That's confidential. That's separate. Um, so there's that distinction there. Um, if public critical comments are made um, in open session about an employee, that could be a violation of an employment contract, which would be a suit against the board, because the, the board is the other party to the contract, not individual board members. There could also be a claim of um, violation of privacy. State uh, the, the California Constitution explicitly has a um, uh, privacy, a, a right to privacy. Federal law, it's it's uh, not as explicit. Um, 
So there have been you know, public disclosure, whether it's in a board meeting or a press conference or whatever the case may be, or making a, um, a statement out in the community, there can be a, uh, a violation of privacy. That is the kind that would, it, that where it wouldn't surprise me that it's against the board and the individual who made the comments. So um, again, it could be, uh, could name the individual. But managers, uh, entities are usually responsible for the things that their managers and their employees do and say. So most of the time, liability flows back to the district as a whole. Um, but that doesn't mean that individuals can't be named. And sometimes um, uh, be at risk of liability based on that. Could you give us a rough, or maybe this is actually an in, in engaged type conversation. I don't know if I'm cross. If I cross, if I cross, just let me know. Mm -hmm. But like what those outcomes, even in an update, I guess, what those outcomes can be financially to the district, which takes money from the teachers, the students, the, right, um, to educate for blatantly just certainly coming up with a random number of 100 in this round and addressing and, and holding all the administrators against it. Like what, what's like a lot, I mean, this is, like what a liability can look like. Um, if, um, if that comes up in our next closed session, like I think that'd be helpful to like, understand how viable that is. It's not a little thing to the district to violate people's contracts and employment contracts. Yeah, it, it should be, I mean, it's another, it's another real, it depends. You're right. Um, something when you're talking about specific facts and circumstances that are, you know, a specific potential litigation, that's a closed session conversation. Um, but in general, your question invokes, um, what is your insurance coverage? What is your deductible? Um, it, you know, your excess liabilities, because a lot of times insurance can become involved in this and in some and in some circumstances it's not um, so and, and uh, so it, that can be a very uh, district specific question based on what JPA they're in and what the scope of the coverage is and um, can you the extent to which some some types of cases some policies for example they co cover the cost of defense they pay the attorneys to defend right. but they don't pay any judgment right. Um, so it, uh, it it really it really depends, and then what a judgment is is usually you know a uh, uh, very dependent on the facts. Um, if you if we I don't know if you can cen censure someone even if you don't have a censure policy, um, but if we did have a policy in place and we did follow that policy and do those things, does that help limit that liability, do you think? Is that why some districts have them? I mean, you could do it without having one. That's you, you might want to hold that discussion because we that have, is oh, that's right, we have that at the end. That is a new policy. Then you're okay. Right. okay, we can hold that. One. Sorry, I know I'm skipping around. I'm so back to 9200. So where are we? Um, I mean, we're just reviewing this. Should I think for some of us emphasize what we perceive as our responsibility to adhere to this. And any more discussion on this item? Well, and Mark's going to provide clarification on if you had the contract as a reference. Um, no. No. Well, no, not there. He said, he said at 93, uh, one about four policies to 90 to yeah, hold think, up for that. Okay. I have a suggestion. That could tie there. Um, I think it's important to always remember they're there, right? Like we have contracts and we agree to things within them. Um, and then when you go through your clarification, um, I guess if there's consensus of, of anything else that you need to clarify within this authority by law, right? Um, when you do go through it, I and mean, when you give us, however, we're responding back to Jan um, and the board, if you could clarify anything there. And then I would really like any cases you think would be helpful for us to understand. If you would tell Victoria, Victoria Research, I don't know how that comes about. But like AG stuff's really hard for me to find without having access to Westlaw or something. Check out. Check out. 
9220. Yeah, because there I know there are a lot of cases and everyone's all fine one. Um and it'd be really great to have those here. Because it helps us understand the depends. Not as 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 us legally trying to figure out what depends, but that like look it really does depend. And then sometimes you see those judgments and it's interesting. <coughs> We reviewed this at our other policy workshop and we kept it as it was. Mm -hmm. So we did not bring it forward as the first week because we didn't make any changes. So we're, it's been problematic to some of us about adherence to this in our viewpoint. So what are, that would be helpful if our viewpoints were similar, if our interpretation was similar. But it doesn't seem to be. That's a majority of the board and we agree on how we're going to cover them. And you're part of the board. No, but I still have my right. It doesn't so say that you're indicating to us basically that you're not going to comply with this. Well, then we should bring it forward and have everybody answer. Well, my complying, it depends on what you mean by complying. It limits not our to the district at risk and not to, to yeah. damage the reputation of the district so that it, it takes away from our focus on education of students. And so it's right now there's something going on out there. It, it's continually popping up, and um, we can get to that later, but there's significant misinformation that is there an obligation to correct because of the damage is still to this work. Yeah. So, but there, there's a difference between correcting something that you don't believe is true. So how many yeah. times would someone need to be told that something is true before it would be incumbent upon them to make that correction? She's saying, I just she's put, that, I put that out there as a question. And I'm just yeah. saying, we have a real basic problem then that I'm not sure how to solve, which ties into the whole issue that's come up also in public meetings about trust, trust mm -hmm. level, which is really problematic, problematic to the damage that that does to the district mm -hmm. uh, and the liability it puts us under. Mm -hmm. So um, this policy alone is going to address that and solve that. I do think that we should put the case as legal references on it and we should bring it forward. Okay, so we okay. have the first reading then at our next meeting. Is that what you're, is that what you're asking, Carol? I am asking. Mm -hmm. Are you going to get case law for me? I think the following meeting. CSBA is usually pretty good about finding the relevant um, cases. case law I have um, an attorney general's general, opinions. Yeah. And, and um, like I said, this 9200 is general, and a lot of it is aspirational. Um, and so you can't. But it's, it's aspirational. Can. You can't. But it's how we agree to govern. It, that's what aspiration is, is that we will govern the community for common justice, which means equity and with our focus on the students, not our focus on and one board member who who feels that her job is to be the administrator and it is not and put our district at jeopardy and not the administrator but feels it's her job to stick up or, or listen to students parents grandparents right well once you listen to i think you have first, to bring that i think forward. what we first start to say is well, where the next is like stick up for that's where you that's what you're well, bring that's that perception. Bring their concerns but that's forward. the perception. When we it's hear people true. speak to us, when we see the things they're writing, that's what they're saying. Right. It's and not your that job. None of the rest of us do that. That only you do that. Okay, okay. so here's it. So you think because I'm just like I can't be present. No, I don't. never said that. Yes, you did. Mm -hmm. No, she said it public me. I can't tell you how many comments I have about that. But you I think I said I, I wanted you to be present. Let's not argue. I know. Said, me, she said I, it's on the recording, okay. and I did have a comment on so, that, that. They found it appalling. But, but in here, you felt like you have to save me, or that something was wrong. And I take that that is your personal personhood, and you have to check that at the door because we are responsible for three thousand or however I should know the exact number. I was wondering, but how many students were responsible for, and how many employees were responsible for, and that. We are the leadership role to them. And when we say we don't trust the people in our organization that we lead, 
That means, what are you saying? That we are, that you yourself are dishonest. That you are not trustworthy. Because you don't trust the organization that you lead. You're leading it. You're leading it by example. An example you're presenting. That's even a mom to sleep with it. And you are not saving them. When they complain that there's been a sexual harassment, there's been this, there's been that, all these, things, all these horrible things that you bring up, and you have not told the people who can fix it. I told Dr. Valoria. You are to tell them. You are to give the information, the exact email, the exact communication to him for I him do. to take care of. I do. So your hundred list, hundred, you your hundred list. No, those that, people were all was all upset crazy. about what had happened. And That's if you want them retaliation, if you, yes, no, I'm not it. talking about them. But right. they were saying that they didn't want to come because of fear of retaliation. If you want, I can ask them all to start emailing Dr. Valoria. Is that what you want? That's what they should be doing. That's what they should be yeah. doing, indeed. That's our process. Everyone who talks to you, everyone if you were seriously he concerned to about that being an issue, you would want them to do that because you would want to emphasize to him that that concern is out there. And then we can look at addressing yeah. it on a larger issue so that it doesn't just fester out there in the community and then people start saying to each other, oh, did you hear that if you complain in the district, they retaliate against your kid? Yeah, so you don't want that. those people to do that. It isn't like a thing saying, oh, we're going to just... What your tone was like, oh, you want them all to email him like it'd be a nightmare for him. No, no. you should have that information. There, there's not so one time a parent has, I'm a parent at the high school. I am there a lot. There's not one time I haven't encountered a parent that had an issue and I say, all these capable, amazing cabinet members are public servants. They are here to serve you and your children. I urge you to email. Lisa Winston, Jeff Dixon, Alicia, because they are competent, thoughtful leaders in this district. I am not an administrator. Please email them with your questions. They are gracious. They are smart. That's what I do. And they say, oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. And I reaffirm, these are public servants. They serve the schools. If I have a kid who has an issue through my own daughter, I call Dr. Valoria immediately, within five seconds. There's an issue. I want to make sure it's followed through. And he takes it. These are competent, smart people. And what you are doing is accusing them of being less than that in public meetings and in your circle of friends. And instead of trying to resolve an issue that maybe someone comes to you with, you embrace it as your charge. And I do not believe that's our job. Because you are then advocating, instead of for 3,000 students, you're advocating for this very narrow line instead of looking at general policy, processes, how we address all students who have issues, whether it's suicide, whether it's depression, whether it's difficulty with homework, it doesn't matter. We need to have address and honor every issue every child has in this district and parent. Okay, so, so you're going back and forth between the 3,000 and the individual issue. Because I put it in the hands of the people who manage 3,000 students and all that, because they are the competencies, they They're are the, the experts. experts, and we don't even They're know the all the issues they may deal with. Right. Yes. They don't bring those to us on an individual basis, but the right. ones that come to us, we pass them on. Oh, right. Our heads are in Ed Code. Like, that's where your answer is. You go to Ed Code to say, do we change the policy? Do I hear enough things that we need a just apology? Their job is the individual person. Not Should yours. we refocus Sorry. back into our focus, and we're going to bring it back to Star's reading? Well, I guess, the, so for clarity, we're bringing it back for our first read, but there's technically nothing But we're changing. not changing it. So then we don't need to bring it back. I think legal reasons. I think it's important. So we adherence to the fall is not a reason to bring it back. Well, no. but, 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 but we have a difference in what adherence is. I think I know, adherence that's is saying I'm not speaking for the board. That's an actually a problem, but we can't write that into here. I mean, yeah. Obviously, I think we can't mandate that, well, that people I think if I bring something to Dr. Valoria, and nothing is done. How do you know nothing well, is done? Well, I mean, let me clarify because, here, because it specifically that's says one case with the forty-five well, contacts with the counselors. I think. Regardless of the case, I go back to this yeah. third paragraph. The third paragraph specifically reads, "So I guess for my clarity's sake, it would be helpful when it says any board member approached directly by a person with a complaint should refer the complainant, not the complaint, the complainant, the, complaint, the okay. person." Okay. To the superintendent or designee. So it's not that any of you hold that complaint. It doesn't say refer the complaint, aka that you now hold it taken. It says complainant. That's my 
understanding okay, is that you're yeah. referring that person to the appropriate staff. Is that and then you let it go. So so right. if that person says I don't like wish to do more that, let it go because I'm afraid of retaliation, then I've done my job because I prefer them even if they don't go to you with a complaint. Well, if you, do, if you let it go, then you're not following up on it to find out how they dealt with it. Well, she just said, but they said, we're not going to complain because we're going to have retaliation against us for our student. And so I don't understand how you can't. So I don't understand how. If it's confidential, though, how are they, if they come to Dr. Gloria and it's in confidence, then how, how is it related to their, first, their student? Then you're, that, that's, in essence, what Peggy says. Then there's that sense of, of you don't have the trust or the confidence in the administration to handle it. Mm -hmm. And that goes beyond Dr. Gloria, then you're, you've got to throw the, whatever site principle it is into the mix because it's going to get handed down, or if it goes to, to Lisa or to anyone else. So we have a huge issue then, mm -hmm. because that's, if, if that's truly how you feel, mm -hmm. Okay, then you're gonna. So we're gonna say we're gonna clean the slate. We're gonna let all these employees go, and we're gonna hire new people. No, I no. I it. feel if I tell somebody to talk to Dr. Bologna, right, and they are afraid to because of retaliation, I've done my job. But I also think there's a bigger issue out there: this fear. You have not done your job when you allow people to feel that they can be retaliated. It's against the law. You have not done your job. Your job is to convince them that they will not be retaliated against, and it is their duty to contact the superintendent when they feel that that is going to happen and express that. That is you do your job. And that was your and if you don't want this job, job don't do this job. Forward. The hundred people that didn't want to come forward, it was because of fear. Yes. I, I don't think we bring it back. My opinion is you don't bring it back for a read when it's just about adherence. Right. And one this person is, I, didn't, I didn't get, I didn't get so it's a real road for reference. We're adding a legal reference. That can be you don't add it for legal reference. You just add it. Okay. I just want to make sure we're following that. Okay. So you're just going to. I would go, I just want to uh, punctuate something that. Another it depends situation. If a parent comes to a board member and says, my child is being relentlessly bullied on the playground mm -hmm. by other students, mm -hmm. there's a legal obligation to follow up on that. I think what I would recommend is that you refer that parent to the principal of the school, mm -hmm. shoot an email to the principal, say that I, I had a complaint about bullying today. If the parent doesn't come to you, then, um, let me know and we can discuss next steps. Or you identify who the person was. But there are certain allegations that you have to follow up on. Yes. Even if a person says, I fear retaliation, I don't want you to do anything about this. I don't. There are certain uh, complaints and allegations that you have to follow up on that you can't. Um, so if it's a significant thing like that, I agree. Like Refer the complaint. Issue. Follow up on and them. make sure that the person who is going to, who you refer them to, is aware that they that this uh, um, complainant might be coming. To it's not. Jobs. It's not but personal follow up by the board member. It's your the board member follow up is to pass it on, mm -hmm. and then you're out. You step back. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the follow up comes from the district person who you passed it on to. Yes. No, I I have found in those cases, even when they included some things that the parents were shocked by because they heard one, their one piece, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it was, that they have gone to the counselors, they've done whatever, and they do follow back up with me and say, thank you for pointing me in the direction. Now, I do let him know. He lets the principal know or whoever needs to know. Or sometimes he might say, they're already aware of that. Right, or whatever it is, right? But I, I do pass those things on to him. The, the ones that are like, right? Like, it's shocking from the parents' reaction. They're, they're, they're upset. Um, and the only calls I've ever gotten back are thanks for pointing me in the direction and things went well. Or how do I address that? Like, I don't understand what you're talking about. But something, right? It might be something you want to ask. And in that case, as board member, we can still speak to that person because they're usually our friend, right? I'm, I'm looking for 
And they're calling to tell us thank you or whatever it is. It's not. Yeah, some people are my friends somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I just want to thank you. And they just follow the process. Okay, we're going to move to the next one, 9310. We're also bringing this back to the discuss because it was in, uh, referred to a number of times. Um, another one that we reviewed at our last policy workshop and we just made no changes in it so it stayed the same and did not come as a first duty but since it has been referenced a number of times it's time to review it again so we're clear on how policy how policy process works in I, I bar it's come out in the IBD like I'm hearing like right I'm interested if, if I disagree with any of these bylaws, I can bring, or wanting something added or changed or work, I can bring that here in this meeting is where you bring it mm -hmm. and discuss it. And that's start the, with you. And you start here. That is the, okay. So it's up to the board member who disagrees to bring something forward and look for, mm -hmm. what did you say earlier? Look for, to a, look for unity. Unity. So. I'm sorry, we're we on 90 through 10. 10. Board of I think the reference that often comes up is page 58. Okay. And so the whole And Mark, I believe, uh, expressed in some of his earlier comments, but uh, page 58, which is, no, I don't have them on the top, sorry. Yeah, but it's just the last. It was that last one. Was there the apologies? <laughs> Oh, and well, I was yeah. looking at the the last sentence in the first paragraph. That's okay. the one that's quoted. Yeah. 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 Um, and I was thinking, right where I put the cursor, mm -hmm. not letting me. Uh, okay. type. Can't drive. But maybe right after districts, um, add. Oh, in, con in contract. Um, legal responsibilities. And contracts, comma. Um, Including, but not limited to. Oh, that's a nice way to tie it all in. Okay. The binding is long as they do not conflict with the law. And they're binding as long as they are consistent with legal responsibilities and contracts, including. Thank you. Legally defined, like defined and binding for us. Like whether I agree with the law or don't agree with the law, or agree with the law. Can you define binding? Does, it, does that mean that the district has a liability? Yeah. No, this is this is more of a statement about yeah the the um, this is not about individual board member um, things that we've been board talking policies. about. Like, but you have policies in place, um, and you're you're defining the extent, extent to which they are binding. Um, and uh, if you have a board policy provision that's you know that or a board bylaw provision that said. Um, if, if, use policy employees have no free speech rights then that would be inconsistent with the law so it's not binding that portion of policy is not binding um, and if you have the kind of the flip side of it is if you have a board policy that is consistent with a contractual obligation consistent with the collective bargaining agreement consistent with the legal responsibility then it is binding and by binding it means um, the people in this room, the other employees of the school district, have a, have an obligation to comply with them. Does it have to indicate uh, policies and bylaws, or is, is bylaw, bylaws concerned? Just the policies are encompassing the bylaws. Does it say board policies? Do policies and bylaws are they? Well, I think you use the same. Um, you use the same policy. Or the, yeah, the same process for your bylaws as well as 
And I, I, just, I was just wondering, does it have to be specifically called out earlier? Because right. there is anything that spells out bylaws. I, but I, I assume that they're the one and the same, but I was one. I know we said that. I think on the early ed code thing, where they had under definitions, I think it defines board policy bylaws. Yeah, all as one thing. Yes, day. and at the top of every okay. page, it says board policies, and then. Oh right. Yeah, I think it. I think it actually defines it in there that it's the same yeah. one of the same. Yeah, yeah, one of the, no, it's the same. Yeah. I learned so much were you going to go back to that last paragraph? No, it's actually no, the same thing. It's, it's, okay. it's essentially the same wording, just okay. at the beginning and at the end. So it would say we had a need to suspend a policy because it was in conflict. Right, it's a conflict of safety law, and that's or part of the process. Or our court decision that okay. the court decision that requires us to change. Yeah, and that last, you really read the two sentences together. Mm -hmm. um, what is called a severability provision that uh, at the very end, it's basically saying if one sentence in here is invalid because it's in by, uh, contrary to law, mm -hmm. it doesn't invalidate the whole bylaw. It only invalidates that sentence. Okay. okay. Oh, I see. So we'll bring that back up. Would that change up? Okay, so we have to change the first reading. Uh, 9321, closed session agenda purposes and agendas. This is a review. When we reviewed this, and it stayed, we did not bring it back before, but we did, it seemed to be some clarification on the purpose. I think the concern was, um, if, I, if I recall, page 62, the pending litigation, and this is section D. And that, that whether that can be discussed in closed session. Yeah, this is the, this is basically a, a, a summary of the Brown Act provisions. A lot of this is the exact language of the Brown Act, um, but the Brown Act only refers to pending litigation, which suggests that it means it's litigation already filed. Mm -hmm. But pending is defined as either litigation that's already been uh, form, uh, initiated formally, um, and then the second is where there are facts and circumstances that there's um, uh, anticipated or potential litigation. Um, and then it goes on A, B, C, and D, uh, and E on the following page are the circumstances that allow for pending litigation closed session. So it's actual or What would circumstances be as far as actual as a fact? What would a circumstance be? Um, well, the, uh, sometimes it's very straightforward, like in C, if you get a receipt of a tort claim, mm -hmm. somebody files a claim for damages, then it's automatic. But somebody, number D, somebody stands in open set session and threatens to sue you. Um, and E is a threat made outside of an open meeting, um, but then there are certain parameters. It's usually A and B. That um, that apply. Uh, if someone wrote a letter to the editor, kind of thing with that. Mm -hmm. like if someone wrote a letter to the editor, including, yeah, I'm trying to think of like how that applies, or if there's an email that someone writes, or yeah, trying well, to raise money to sue the district. A letter to the editor saying I am contemplating suing the school district for blank blank blank. Would that fall? That would be in B. Indeed. That's facts and circumstances that are known to the plaintiff. They're, they're saying oh. publicly. Okay. Um, uh, and then you publicly disclose that before you go in, going into a uh, closed session mm -hmm. to discuss potential litigation arising from a letter to the editor on the plan. And um, what if it's more, um, what if it's more like what falls in E? More of the... 
outside of the meeting or something like a letter to the editor? Yeah, well, um, I think E contemplates uh, a statement made to an employee or a board member, directly to a board member or employee outside um, of a, um, a meeting where okay. you have to make a, you know, a written record of it. Um, you know, on this date and time, I, I received a, um, a threat of litigation. Um, so the, the, the example that I gave could, it could logically fit in B or in E. Um, okay. And then A is if we know about something, um, you know, if the administration knows about something that, that could cause litigation, but nobody else knows about it, um, and you want to keep, and you need to, there's a reason for keeping it confidential, that, that would be A. The, all of it. All of this is because um, you can't invite me or any other of your counsel to close session just because of attorney-client privilege. Yeah, the the Brown Act is narrower than that. You can only have a, a conference with legal counsel if there are circumstances where uh, either litigation has been initiated or in the opinion of that lawyer based on existing facts and circumstances there's significant exposure to litigation. Okay. Um, that's when you can and then you discuss that potential litigation. Because um, otherwise we could call you in for other reasons around negotiation or some other thing that wouldn't be fair, right? Like we have, yeah. That's the point. Okay. So all that for example, a, a, you want to have a Brown Act workshop you know, right. uh, or, and, but you want to be able to ask questions about things that were done previously and ask your attorney, did we violate the Brown Act? Um, that wouldn't be a basis for a closed session. What I, my answer to that question would be attorney client communication, but that's where those kinds of questions should be answered separately in writing because you're not allowed to just have a closed session because you want to get legal advice from your lawyer that has to be related to potential litigation. So attorney client, so if I were to share existing litigation. So if I share, so you were you were to write something, a brief, which we've had before with Doe. Right. Yeah. If I share that with the board, that's attorney client privilege. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And that there was actually a, a uh, California Supreme Court case where um, the argument was that distributing a legal opinion to members of the city council was a meeting under the Brown Act, um, and they hadn't posted it. And the, the California Supreme Court basically said, opening your mail is not a meeting. So you can distribute things in writing. It's when it becomes a back and forth face to face communication about it. Okay. Yeah. That's, then that's when it becomes that's a meeting. Yeah. Or if it's pending yeah. litigation or something like that, close, but not okay. so that court field. Yeah, Within our group of board members, so we had at least one, I'm not sure if it was the second one also, members of the public that spoke to us in, in an open session that said that they were encouraging Member Perry to bring action against us for violating her rights. So how how do we consider that as, do we then just wonder if that's coming and then we would confer with you on that because, I mean, how would we do that when it's one of the five board members? Uh. That would be something. That's that's a specific legal question that I don't think I should answer in a public okay. setting. Right. I'll do that in writing. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then, so we don't, we're not making any changes to this at this point. No. No, this is really. I would hope that 
in some ways we could change this policy to actually reflect what we do and to clear up this huge misperception of what goes on. And I will say that not just with our current superintendent, any time over the years that I've been in this position, I've not put anything on the agenda that I brought in and said, let's put this on the agenda. It's, um, the, the agenda has been prepared by our people that we hired for the different departments. They come to the agenda review. It's just for, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't belittle it. It's an important task to run the meeting efficiently, but it allows that to happen. It isn't to say, they don't sit there and say, okay, what would you like to put on the agenda? I've, not, I've never done that. And um, so what we have done, to me, what we've adopted is a practice of bringing something forward to see if, not just if the board, I mean, all five board members want to put something on the agenda, then we look to our people that do the work for us and say, where does this fall in the timeline? If we, we of course, have the authority to say, no, I, we demand that it be on the next agenda, so drop everything you're doing now and then prepare this item because items do have work behind them to prepare. And I just, I would like to have a policy that actually reflects what we have decided is a practice we want to follow so that there's not this idea that it's done and that you, nobody else has the right to do it. That's, that doesn't exist, and so that policy that that doesn't reflect what happens. That's my biggest concern on this. Well, and then I have I have that same concern. And also, um, Mark, the other thing in the policy is when you read through it, it takes you to. Hang on a second. Okay, it takes you to if you're a board member, like what all the process is. But it leads off because it says it's talking about board in the last paragraph of page. Oh, you know what? I have the one on mine. I marked up the one that was out of my. Um, it's on screen. So where are okay. you? Oh, thank you. So any board member or member of the public can request that matter within jurisdiction of the board be placed on agenda with me. Right. So it starts there and talks about um, any member of the public, board member. And then we get the next page. It continues along explaining that. And all of this makes sense, um, right? There's, you're determining, does, is there jurisdiction? You're determining timing. You're determining whether this is just an information item, somebody needs more information. You're having a conversation with whoever you know, presented the information or made the request. But it goes on to talk about the board member, and it doesn't talk about the member of the public anymore, because it talks about the board member Board member and superintendent do not request the board member to place the item on the agenda. The board member may request the board to take action to determine whether the item shall be placed on the agenda, which we do at the end of the meetings, right? You can bring it there. Um, but it doesn't mention anything about the public anymore. The public kind of dropped off. And I didn't see it picked back up. Yeah, my, my read on that is the first paragraph you pointed out that mm -hmm. starts with any board member or member of the public. Mm -hmm. That's an expectation for both of those categories that you submitted in writing um, at least two weeks before the scheduled meeting. Mm -hmm. The next paragraph refers to requests from members of the public to place an item on the agenda. The information, the, the paragraph after that oh, I gotcha. refers right. to requests from a board member right. to place an item on the agenda. So, so basically it's that um, there's the, the legal reference in here at, at Code 35.145.5. And I think I mentioned at the last meeting that the, uh, the Keeney versus Garcia, um, in particular case, uh, um, addresses the scope of that. So that paragraph about the board president and superintendent deciding whether it's going to be uh, placed on the agenda, I think would be consistent with those legal parameters. For a board member. Okay, so before we before we jump to board members, so mine was the thought about the public. So, so they determine whether it's an issue, whether it's be covered the existing policy or administrative regulation, or whether they just need some information, right? Or or refer the person back to the site because the site's working on something around that, right? Like they just need some information. But let's say it goes through all that and they say, no, I want this, you know, I type this up, I want this on the agenda. I did read where there's discretion if it's not in the jurisdiction in that case. Um, 
Well, and, and, yeah, and the, but, the statute refers to it being directly related to the district's business. And in that case, because... Right, not the state business, directly to the district. That's right, yeah, to the district it was, business. It was an issue that related to one, one school, and the, and the decision was, right, that, okay. as a matter of policy, the board doesn't make decisions well, related to right. activities at individual schools. Right. And um, for that reason, they said they, they didn't put it on the uh, agenda. And, and it was a help. Okay. So does that broadly go across to anything that just, like the, um, when we changed pathways to align with, um, since we're in the state of California, UC school systems, so that no one had artificial grade bumps, we also didn't have artificially paid teachers. You know, like they, teachers didn't get bumps for those pathways as well. Clean all that up. People want to keep discussing it. We already discussed it, which I, I, I guess covered, but people can put anything they want on an agenda so without reading those cases, right? Put anything you want on an agenda. But it doesn't mean that they have to do any work for it, does it? Like if you're like, fine, you can go on the agenda, but they need to come present and talk about it. The person that wants to put it on the agenda. Am I confused what I'm reading? There's a lot to comprehend in here, so I'm not. And this I don't like. My husband and I are married, so. I think. Um... <laughs> The, the courts have applied an abuse of discretion standard to the decision on whether or not to put an item on the agenda. So to use an exaggerated example, if a member of the public, you make a decision A at your first meeting in March, a member of the public doesn't like it. So I want A back on the agenda at the next meeting in March. Um, and let's say it goes on the agenda and no board makes a member makes a motion to change it. They just speak for three minutes and then you can move on to the next board item. And then they make a request to put it back on the agenda. The next I don't think it would be an abuse of discretion to say, no, we've decided that. The board, the board considered it fully. Um, and there's been one opportunity to, uh, for them to um, hear from you for three minutes and decide whether to um, re-evaluate that decision. I don't think it would be an abuse of discretion to not put it on. I mean, the board has the authority to um, have reasonable regulations so that it can get its business done. Right. Um, it's a it's business meeting you're thing. conducting right. um, and not a town hall meeting that you're conducting. Right. And, and so you can control your agenda in that way. Um, so um, I don't. I'm just looking to make sure we're not violating. I get the discretion. I didn't realize the discretion could be used so broadly. I kind of just thought, well, they only have one in high school. So I'm on site, right? We don't do. Um, but that, your example to me sounds more like a, uh, a policy. You happen to have one decision, but you were really as acting as a legislative body. The Mooney versus Garcia decision was an activity at one school mm -hmm. on one day. Mm -hmm. And a parent wanted it to be changed from a certain kind of activity to a different kind yeah. of activity. And the board said, we don't get in the middle of that stuff. Right. Um, and so... Uh, but this is a digital thing I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, you right? obviously can have, if you're going to modernize one of your elementary schools, the item on the agenda is only going to be about that okay. school, but it's not an activity for, for one day. So case-by-case right. um, case kind of uh, scenario. What does a, a member of the public do if they made a request and it's denied? Do they have? Well, the recourse would be to, to file a lawsuit like the parent did in, in the Mooney decision. Um, so it's not the only recourse to file a lawsuit? They can come speak for three minutes at the beginning of every meeting and share it they Well, want. yeah. When that is everyone's public eyes or public public has a right to waste, to utilize our time in the way they would like to utilize our time. Yeah. That person, yeah, you're right. You could come um, during a yeah. public comment on the agenda. Is your first issue referring to that request that came recently that was presented to us? That, and just kind of the thought of, um, in my, yeah, that it is, but yeah. also just, yeah, but also just my thought of, like, how do you just put something on an agenda in the sense of, not that I have anything for the agenda, it just makes me curious about how that works. Carol, so Carol asked, you know, so what's the, say a request comes in completely different, to, uh, uh, unrelated to the more recent one, but just 
uh, request comes in, to what degree does that request then dictate staff work? Is That's the question what that, that Carol was questioning. So does that mean now this person has requested you know, a, a presentation on it? Now, that's the public now directing staff's work, not the board directing mm -hmm. staff's work. What's the so then, yes, it would be added as an agenda item, but with no formal presentation from staff until the board would say, yes or no, we would like you to bring this back as a formal presentation. So that was the question that yeah. Carol had posed, and, and I think the clarity that I provided was was that, that I believe it, would be, it could be added to the agenda, um, but it does not indicate staff would be necessarily preparing so information. So it's and, and no, nothing done for it in a sense, and then it would just. It would give them, as, as Mark said so in, in his example, the person wanted it back on. Staff added it back, or it was added back onto the agenda. The board listened to that person. There was no formal presentation. Right. That's the public. Then the public comment on that. And then, and then, and then the board would make, could make a decision. Right, and, and I can't see public comment on things on agenda. Equal to they could put something on the agenda and make public comment to it, right? It's kind of the same, like. But I don't want. No, that's what I'm trying to get clarity. I don't want someone to feel they're being denied a right because they can go and speak about it because it's not on the agenda. I don't feel that it's staff. I I, should, I guess I'll say more staff because we direct the superintendent. He has his designees. So the board was elected to direct to hire support direct the superintendent. Then their responsibilities. So. If the board isn't directing the superintendent to then do anything about that item, the person got their chance to talk about their item. It appeared on the agenda. It appeared on the agenda. Yes. And it goes, but. And nothing happened with it. And I think yeah. that actually is the intent, because this is a district business. It's not, it's not school site. I totally like the distinction in that. It makes it easier. That case really does allow you to look at stuff and be able to break it down. But this really is a district level policy. We already voted on it though, so kind of thought, well, does Brown Act affect the fact that we've already voted on it, so thus we don't go back and redo that? So we review it within the law. We review it within updates and stuff, but it's well, not law. I mean, it's not just that we voted on it, as far as public placing items on the agenda. That's, yeah, it's in it's the law. law. Right. It's yeah. not in the Brown Act. It, it oh, it's not in the Brown Act. It only so applies we, to school districts. Then that would oh, be right. something that we could do going forward to satisfy that. Criticism is that we just don't, we just put something by name on the agenda. There's no background preparation, no presentation done for it. I think the person who email they submit it, an option. the person who asked for that then can speak to it, and then the board would discuss. But can a board member do a presentation? Because that's what I feel like the next step will be. Well, so well, but before we, but before, we but before we get to that, I think that actually well, when did we have that? But before we get to there. Before, I think we actually put the email the request comes with, and it's their request, just on the agenda. And I don't know what you create. It, 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 well, information or action. They're asking for action, and we take no action. There's no action, but it still doesn't mean we're directing the superintendent to do anything. He is not the well, I was concerned with this format that was sent to us. No, no, we would just we would put it in our own format. Yeah, that mean a, a person outside of the, the scope of knowing what the outside can't say there's no budget impact. I mean, they can't, right, they can't, can't make those assumptions as far as it's presented in our agenda. I didn't mean like that one. I, I didn't mean like that. I just meant like that, that information is presented. However, presented. it goes on the agenda. We are not, unless we take action, but we do something, we are not constructing superintendent to do anything. It's just there. I understand that. Uh, yeah. Okay, now jumping over to what if school board members. Well, let, let me finish, let's finish with this one. I think the perception is if something is on the agenda and like you said, they're not expecting to take staff time to do anything, but they would like to make a presentation. They got three minutes with a series of people, and they would like to be able to use the no, overhead. I don't think that's what the law states. Well, that's I'm saying that's the perception. I don't know that that's what the law yeah, states. But the they're thinking of if it's an agenda item, they, they can not present you. their, you know, they can present how this is. Maybe hurt students by having it this way. They can present what is the districts, etc. Well, there, it's public, that's public comment. So your rules are limit limits public comment on the item. They right. there's a full presentation that they can provide. It would be like you said, from public so the the so. group that did the non toxic like the getting rid of Roundup. I thought they were quite um, thoughtful in that they each spoke their three minutes. Mm -hmm. They had some uh, supporting documents they handed out to us. 
Um, I thought they utilized the system and what I think the system is made for, which was they organized, they, they were respectful. They already with Mr. Dixon. I mean, what? they already had some contact with Mr. Dixon. Yeah, so they already had information, but they their supporting documents were valuable, but our staff didn't do anything, and yet we got it in a, I just thought, I found that to be, well, they were professional and polite, and well, I mean, it was a, it was that kind of presentation as far as being accusatory and, and they were also aware that we couldn't, because it was not on the agenda, there was no action to the item. It was a, kind of an item you think about or you reflect on or you might in your board. So, so to me, they were one we perfect have to be package clear then for me. That these things are coming as information to the board. That a person then, that, that's how do we differentiate a person that wants an action item on? They can't put an action item in. Well, you don't have to take an action board. Because so if it's an action item, then it would be if we're going to go any further with it, would that be the action? Well, we would just take no action. We're still No, but I'm still, we still have to vote on it if it's an action item. Well, no, we don't have to vote no. on it. No, no. no. We, uh, motion. The, no what, motion. I, what I've no. seen no. at meetings no. is second. this item was placed on the agenda by a member of the public. Mm -hmm. You have three minutes to speak to the item. The person speaks. Then at the end, do I have a motion? If there's no motion. Or if there's a motion and no second, it's done, and you move on to the next agenda item. Yeah. We start so I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's two-step process, really. Step one is, does it get onto the agenda, you know, based on the criteria in that end code section? Um, and then if it does, um, members of the public have a right to uh, comment on it. Um, some, and I don't recall yours, but some boards have bylaws that limit total amount we of do. public comment time on any meeting to 20 minutes. So if you have 10 speakers that have submitted cards, you can reduce it to two minutes for each one. Um, things like that, That's those have been upheld. Um, and then another thing that comes into play that people try to do sometimes is they four people fill out cards and then three of them say we want to give our time to right. the fourth one. Um, you don't have to allow that. Um, you can limit individual speakers are limited to the designated amount of time. And then uh, however many speakers are there, there are, if there are none, if there's one, if there's a, a certain number, you uh, allow that speech to, uh, to occur. And if it's an information item, there can be brief discussion about it if the board wants to. But it's an item for action. Then, under typical parliamentary rules, the board doesn't discuss it, discuss it until there's a motion and a second, and then that opens the floor for discussion. But if there's no motion or no second, then it dies right there. It died right there, and we go on to the next thing. So I'm thinking we we make this known that that we're going to do a process like this. But to my knowledge, we haven't done this before. I mean, it's been decided. Outside of that level, it hasn't been decided by bringing, putting it on the agenda from the public. So, um, would we legally be allowed to limit the number of those that appear on any one agenda? And what I'm thinking of is our one speaker who spoke nine times at the last meeting, and I think 13 times the meeting before. If we had a sufficient of five or six items to put on the agenda, and can we limit the number that we would put on? At a time and we can delay them. Yes. Could we just lump those together as because public? I can see them, call I can see them in that way. And I can think of some of the topics that were raised as far as criticisms of us if those were allowed to kind of agenda items. But couldn't we put them all as like one public agenda item? Like, not if they're not as an agenda that's, item. Isn't so that public comment on non agenda items? I mean, isn't that what that's well, like? Well, they want it just on the agenda. They don't want it to be a non agenda mm -hmm. item. Right, they want it on the agenda. So they don't. I don't think. Um, opportunity for public criticism is an item for an open session. Well, I'm saying the things that have been within that criticism. I see those, the things that have been within the criticism, I see coming as an agenda item. Yeah. Great. Well, but then you'd use the discussion whether that's the district business. Well, this, this one of the particular criticisms was that everything in the entire world is under our jurisdiction. Yeah, so, so well, that's not then so. If, then if you but, answer that in, in the negative, no, that isn't our jurisdiction, then that could be the agenda item. What falls 
a definition of what falls under. That was the case. We work on climate change. But, but, okay. but someone, <laughs> but someone <laughs> presenting who's not a California lawyer just but what's in our jurisdiction is not. I don't put on that. <laughs> pay, pay a lawyer to. I understand. Who's that. I'm not like being facetious because I don't, because I that's what we're dealing with. But that's why I, mean. I think each of those are covered in that policy, just the way it is, of deciding that. I meant there are ones that um, should just go on the agenda, and they should go on the agenda for them to have their place on the agenda. It should be really because clear. It's the, it's the law that allows it to be there. This thing, we we do know, not have to be prepared for that. You know, the fifteen speakers to one agenda item, and then I'm going to tie in. I sense that a board member might, might want to present with the people putting things on the agenda. That's what well, I then you can't motion anything if you do. If you leave your diet, diet, diet. Is that true? Diet, 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 Yeah, but then you join the public <laughs> meeting. Exactly. You, name, you don't ever get to vote on that item, ever. I think your uh, member of the public hat, I thought he mm -hmm. used the hat analogy, is okay. different than a board member hat sitting on the dais as a member of the legislative body. Two different right. roles. Okay. Um, and I, if I leave it to go public, to go be public, then when that comes up to vote, I can't go back and vote. I'm now public. And I, and I, I can find the case. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you can also go back to receipt and make a motion if it, it's no second. You, you can't. You don't have the right to motion know. something you don't leave as a public speaker. I don't know. I, there's I actually a case, there's actually a case law on it. If it's, if it's one subject item, what do you think? And you go up and speak as I think it rarely comes up. I'll just be blunt here because if a board member wants somebody something on the agenda, they can usually find uh, somebody else to put it on the agenda and present on it, so and then they on. can stay in their role as a board member. I mean, that's just that's just that's a fact of the matter. Right. But, uh, and if it doesn't get on the floor, then the board members don't discuss it. Correct. So we brought this one back several times. Yes. Okay. Well, and I'm not sure for, I do have a couple of little questions. So I don't know, do we need to change anything in here, Mark, under under that board person's potential decide whether so we're no. taking off the four places the item on the agenda? Do we need to leave the four places the item on the agenda? There it is. Leave what leave? Uh, on that paragraph there we're taking off the four places the item on the agenda, because it really just kind of ends with we're gonna provide them. And I don't know where you are, I'm sorry. Oh, the board president and superintendent, the first paragraph on on your screen, we're striking that sentence or the full, I mean, the end of the sentence of the first paragraph before placing the item on the agenda. We are, it's in the first part of the sentence. In addition, before placing the item on the agenda, it's at the beginning of the sentence. It's just been crossed off the end of the sentence. Yeah, like that. Okay. Um, and the word may. We might want to. Under that agenda preparation and considering current practice, instead of develop, can we say review? Well, hang on, he's working on, Mark's working on this one as well. Because I guess you could fold review into the develop context, but I think when a person reads this, they really see that as something that is done by one person in the superintendent, which I, does not reflect what you do. And I don't think we want. I talked to a city council member this weekend, and John Peter prepares, and his staff prepare the agenda for the city, and then they review it with, um, like, mm -hmm. with the. Um, so back to that paragraph. The end of the first sentence within the subject matter jurisdiction of mm -hmm. the board, mm -hmm. and, and and this is from the statute and directly related to school district business. Business. 
And then we are leaving that May right after that, and May not shell, because it really is leaving the shell that May gives discretion. Are we? Yeah. I like May there because it gives discretion, but I'm just clarifying that as why. Yeah. Or or should be uh, red. red too. Leaving May is no. yeah. it allows for discretion versus shell. Then Janet's question was related to the first steps. Yeah, under agenda preparation. I want them there, and nobody else on the board gets to do that. And that's not true. That's not true. That's not true at all. That's why you shouldn't have to clarify it there because you develop it. And it wasn't true with previous superintendents that I've worked with. What you said something like the superintendent in coordination with staff shall develop, and then the superintendent will be the And review that? Because Victoria's actually planning another portion of the year. <laughs> well, I know what you have a little like when it appears. One, one more required to take out. I think it's, it's the, the challenge of, of both markets. One, you have the perception that you know, the president has increased authority to just create an agenda. The other flip side of that is the perception that somehow I'm the only one who develops yeah. the agenda. So which it's, it's together. which, it, you know, in conjunction, we, we have obviously obligations to. Budget yeah. same interim. These guys all work things that we have to do in different timelines. So those are those are set and kind of process. Um, so I, I guess it is a little bit of a one person reads it one way, another person reads it another. So they, you know, well, you it, just can you clarify it? I don't know you can, you know, because you're trying to meet two different needs, right? One is one person sees it one way. And I think I, at the end of the meeting, it seems to be like within compliance with the law, the laws. Well, and then you're, I don't know, you then you're probably uh, changing that. I mean, my inclination is to leave it like it is. Um, and I think you better. I know you have a bylaw on the board mm -hmm. president that lists the uh, duties of a board president that might need to be changed if you change mm -hmm. this also. Oh, we just um, I think if we change that, that will do. We change the we just, we just put in board president. Well, but I think you do need to put someone in that tried to reflect it on that. Look at her. Okay. Consult the superintendent designating out preparation for the objectives. And that's in place now, correct? Mm -hmm. Consult. Because we the have in this policy. Okay, so now going back to this one. This one. about um, the superintendent as secretary to the board in consultation with the board president will develop the agenda for each regular and special meeting. And the, the language in the two is aligned. Okay, should we include it all that the other staff that would just leave it as, as superintendent? Because that's what you made your comment, Jason, about that people think it's just it's you, right? Because, it's not your power, and it isn't. I mean, you're you you oversee all that, but you definitely delegate that to the different specialties that they have in their assistant positions, or even also the directors who prepare items. 
That's a, I think that's good wording. Uh, I think could, could you it not matches the, the president's success, so I think it works for me. Okay. Is that okay? And, and normally, um, um, maybe, yeah. but in, maybe not always, but most of the time in a policy or bylaw where it's a superintendent or designee, that's based on the others. board delegating the authority okay. to the superintendent. The, the, this is more of a day-to-day -day thing where the superintendent can say, I'm developing the agenda, I need your agenda items by blank, and then the superintendent puts the agenda together that, in consultation with the board. It's president. only been recently that we've had to issue with this for the, you know, this has been interpreted as just being something that's done to deny others yeah. access. There's never been a question like that before. So, just, uh, that's all my reasons to try to clear that up. Any other changes for um, Hang on a second. Um, um, just a time check. We only have about um, nine more minutes, right. so I want to. I have a we have two more after this. On um, the next page, right above agenda. Which page? The page. Dissemination to the board members mm -hmm. about that. Board talks about any board action to involve borrowing a hundred thousand dollars or more shall be discussed, considered, and deliberated upon. Is this about our policy about moving the money back and forth? No, it's more it's about uh, putting things on consent. That that's probably goes from years ago. <laughs> so we're borrowing money here to consent. You're just you're not talking about it. You're just approving it. So it kind of puts a, a number that. To look at as far as making sure that it's transparent, right? I, Mark, wait, so consent items, we, consent items, like we've already voted on contracts, we've already voted like we're paying people, more, and consent is really just passing that through, not having to look at it. No, we look at it. Well, no, 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 I mean, like, not having to take ac action on it individually. I shouldn't say look. And that's why you can pull So, general business on the districts. Is yeah. It goes yeah. into consent. But if it was something new or whatever, it comes to as a general contract. Yeah. yeah. And that's not. Is that's, that kind of, it's not a legal question, really. It's consent okay. items are items that it is anticipated or not going to generate a lot of discussion or need for uh, oh. discussion. And then, but that's why I've seen in your meetings, that's why something can be pulled from consent mm -hmm. if it turns out the staff is wrong on that. That, right. that one or more board members wants to some discuss a specific item. Yeah. Now, is there a difference? It seems like there's a difference now from the previous superintendent about bringing, putting items on the agenda if they don't take up staff time. We all want to be mindful of staff time, but before um, you could put an item on the agenda and in fact I was told to put item, several items on the agenda and do the background work. So no staff time is taken. Well, I, guess I don't think we can to... discuss that situation in an open meeting. Yeah. That was before me. I know, but I'm saying that's yeah. well, no, that's a personnel issue, basically. Well, yeah. but it's, I mean, I... No, it is a personnel issue. Well, but I'm not understanding, has that changed? How, how, how do you do that if it's an item for the agenda that is not going to take staff time? Is that treated differently? When we, when leaders change in organizations, mm -hmm. if they hypothetical, leaders change in organizations, how an organization is then ran and the staff and how things work changes. Will change mm -hmm. is based in that change. And um, it's everyone's job to align to the leader they choose. 9322 lines out a process for which an important mm -hmm. would add an item, which we already. We just discussed yeah, so right. So it's still a process that wouldn't be the same as if it was declined. There was a process by which a board member may request an item be added. That's, so there's no difference right. if it's something that takes staff time or that. What you guys just as a group put forward was specific to the statement yeah. that if the board president and superintendent and I request from a board member to place an item on the agenda, that board member may request the board take action at total whether the item shall be placed on the agenda. So yeah. that's it comes up with anything. So it's been in there. So. Okay. So that would be the process. That okay. Be so is there is there a prop? So say the board's 
agrees and says yes, then, then does that, does that mean that you can say, no, I don't want to direct staff to spend time on this, but you can do your research? Well, I think that goes back to limits of board authority, the administrative function. So, um, so you don't decide which way you wanted to go? I think currently that would be the board, the board majority would give us that. Right. For me, if the board yeah. majority said yes, we want to go ahead and put this on the agenda, and the staff are in preparation. But can the board say we want to put it on the agenda, but we don't want staff to spend time on it? If the majority, the majority of the board said that. Said that. Majority rules, yeah. yeah. Okay, majority rules. Okay. So it can go either way. Got three votes. And then I have one more question under agenda dissemination to members of public. Just more on this hand. Under um, only those documents which are dis disclosable public records under the Public Records Act, and which are linked to agenda items scheduled for open session session, a regular meeting shall be available to public. What does that mean? Okay. Um, with, uh, oh, she's right here. Yeah, it's like that. Oops. So when I, when I took my and you your first have, hundred uh, days, it was like anything you write as a culture board member could be public record. And whoever doesn't mean you could have an agenda item to enter into a contract, and um, a legal opinion, a written legal opinion about the legality of entering into that contract. And so, if the board, the contract would be a public record. The legal opinion that's going to the board would not be a public yeah. record, so the, the public would not have access to it. Okay. Yeah. And who makes those determinations whether it's public record or not? Oh, yes, definitely. Okay. All right. Um, she does. <laughs> okay. Sometimes, sometimes in consultation with counsel. You know, okay, so that's good. Okay. I'm assuming there's training and all that. Right. Okay. Oh, sorry, guys. It's 11. I guess. Okay. Okay, so this one's going to report three. Yes. Yeah. Only 1057. We have three minutes. Right. <laughs> oh, thanks. So we have actions by the board 9323.2. This is just that. Uh, so again, it just language. It emphasizes majority mm -hmm. throughout. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. So no changes on that one? No. Are, are there any cases you suggest that we should just? Read or be aware of or know about under a legal reference or just whatever is on CPA or something like that. Because sometimes that's a case of. I'll let you check this one because yeah. back at this time we won't stop necessarily putting all the cases on. We know that we're very well at 10 percent. Yes. And I, I sometimes find I'm not pointing that out and wonder that case was like, oh, that's what he's meant. Read it, Carol. Read it. <laughs> so we have one minute left. So we're going to censure individual board members that can carry on that one. Or are we on actions by the board? Or are we on actions by the board? Which we reviewed also the last policy. Correct. Urgency that it was a majority issue. Is there any interest for us to bring back since we're yes. 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 Is there any changes that the board would like us to make between now and first read? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Yes
opposition to, this is what I've seen a lot, in opposition to uh, cannabis uh, um, establishments or um, even immigration policies and things mm -hmm. like that. That is an act, that's the Board of Education exercising its free speech right. Okay. So um, when we advocate for some legislation, that we yeah. advocate as a whole yeah. for something like that. Yeah. Where um, legislative bodies have gotten into trouble with censure is where they censure and remove somebody from committees and strip them of oh, things. Then, it, then that's when it crosses the line to punishment right, that for makes sense. free speech as opposed to just the board exercising its free speech. Right. Okay. There's, a, uh, there's a good uh, 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 anybody who's not familiar with the name Steve Rocco? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know I worked with him for years. Should be a check. <laughs> uh, so, oh, so anyway, so he, he sued Orange Unified after they censured him for disclosing personnel information in open session. Oh. Um, the district filed an anti slap motion, which um, is a slap is a strategic lawsuit against public participation. You can file an early motion. Basically, it's a Lawsuit filed in retaliation for some uh, for exercise of free speech rights can be dismissed at an early stage. So the court dismissed the lawsuit and ordered him to pay the district's legal fees. Um, um, so that will be one of the uh, citations. And an okay. appellate court upheld it. Okay, um, I just handed it because we got that, and it does say you could do something from committee and stuff. So I'm, I'm just thinking that might not be right now. I, I, uh, I had the occasion when I was general counsel at San Diego Unified to research censure pretty mm -hmm. uh, significantly, and there are um, there are cases that where that has found been found to be punishment. So I, I routinely recommend that censure should be just that a motion for censure and an adopt, adopting usually a resolution, uh, a censure resolution, but not removal from committees or things like that. Okay. It just creates legal issues. And how does the board do that when the board can't? Well, lays it out in there as far as in formal one to one. So. The process is very clear. And that's what the problem is. Timelines included. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we have a motion to adjourn. Senate. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you.